Here we are. Slush 100 semifinals. Are you ready? I want to get some noise out of you. Come on. Are you ready for the semifinals? Great. My name is Marco Vautilainen. I'm the head of startups at Slush. I'm also running the Slush 100 competition. I'm going to run through what's going to happen today, well, how we got here, what's going to happen today. I'm also going to introduce the five judges that we have in the front, and then we're going to get into the actual competition. How did we get here today? We had over 1,100, yes, 1,100 applicants into the competition this year, and that was fantastic. But what's even cooler is the fact that we had exceptional candidates. From that group of 1,000 plus companies, we picked the top 100. After that, the investors then went in, looked at their pitch decks, and picked the top 50. After that, the investors went in and picked the top 20 based on pitch videos that our fantastic top 50 had then sent in. What's going to happen next is we're going to have the top 20 then come on one by one and present their companies to you, but also to the judges in the front. How is that going to work? Every single company is going to come here one by one. They're going to pitch for exactly four minutes. If they go overtime, I'm going to come on stage and interrupt them. After those four minutes, the fantastic judges here are going to be asking company building questions, anything they would ask in an investor call from these founders. We're going to do that 10 times, have a break, 10 times again so that we have 20 founders done. And after that, what's going to happen is the judges are going to be escorted to a secret room where they then deliberate on who the top three is going to be. And then in a couple of hours, we're going to announce the actual finalists who step on the stage tomorrow uh, on the founder stage. Cool. I think we're ready to begin. But before we go into the actual competition, what I'd love to do is introduce our fantastic judges. The prize money for this year, or the prize equity investment, is worth a million euros. And that comes from no one else except from the five best early stage investors in the world. Axel, General Catalyst, Lightspeed, NEA, and Northzone. I'm going to introduce the judges to you one by one. And I'm going to ask that you also wave in the front when your name is said. From Lightspeed on the left, we have Alex. From Northzone, we have Maxine. From Axel, we have Rafael. From NEA, we have Luke. And from General Catalyst, we have Alex. These are some of the best investors I've ever met, and they're really, really cool people. So I'm expecting really good questions today. Uh, cool. Are we ready to get it going? Thumbs up? Awesome. First up, we're going to have Congrify. I'm not going to share too much about the company, because the founder is going to tell you more about it. But it's a really, really cool company. Um, and I hope that you also give them the space and the room's attention when they get going. So when I walk off, please give them a crazy round of applause. Is that all right? Cool. Please welcome Congrify. Yeah, and we're kind of... Hi. We're going along. Yeah, I think we already started. Sorry if I'm sitting, I'm a bit sick. My name is Marco Conce, founder and CEO of Congrify, payments observability and intelligence company. And I always start with the statement, what do we do? We support merchants and payment service provider to unlock the power of payments data. Personally, I bring 10 years of payments industry experience working with uh, payment service providers, merchants, and many other companies that you see here. I'm super happy to have Alex Timoshenko as a CTO and co-founder. He comes from Booking.com, where he built payments from scratch 10 years ago. And late joiner, we have Alex Turkov, Chief Operations Officer, with 10 years of operational experience in fintech and payments. It's not a secret that payments, digital payments are increasing as importance, but this brings a lot of complexity. There are many payment service providers globally. There are many payment methods. The trends are increasing, regulatory requirements, and it's getting complex. That's where people that are working with payments and finance are looking at things that are changing, and they need data. We see that this is one of the major, uh, major issues for their operational tasks, for their uh, audits, for their compliance, for their financial reconciliation. There are many challenges because it costs money to build. The uh, provider landscape is fragmented. 
knowledge is scarce. And that's where we come in with a pure code, no code solution where uh, we allow users to leverage access to payments data. Stripe, that if many people know, estimated that to build this, it costs $800,000 if you are a merchant. We do this and we either give the data to the merchants with data that warehouses connections or with our uh, dashboards. We started to build the product this year. Uh, it's a modular solution. Some modules are already built. And for 2024, we are focusing on AI power recommendations, alert real monitoring, and real-time monitoring, and many new features which are in the area of payments processing. Just to give you a highlight, what users can see today, they can log into our dashboard. All the data are there. No developments, no codes, no single line of code. And they can monitor several different things. Our pricing model, it's a mixture of subscription and request-based working in different, uh, in different tiers, looking at the amount of connections that companies have, the monthly events, the data retention, and the modules which are enabled. Some payments industry feedbacks. Um, I bring the first one from Dennis, which is in charge of payments at Flixbus, one of our early customers, and many others that are confirming the pain in this specific topic. The market is growing. Uh, we estimated that by 2028, there will be a serviceable available market of 3.7 billion in the payment orchestration and intelligence business. If we look at the competition, we position ourselves in the area, I'm just going to point it out here, between payment serviceability and intelligence. If you look at payments processing today, you have two different types. One uh, is more legacy, where our solution works perfectly on top with more modern solutions such as Stripe, Adian, it works perfectly because merchants very often have different, um, have different providers and we are there unifying the data and uh, solving problems. Where we are right now, we are building the products, we are validating the go-to-market, we are having the first paying customers, as I mentioned, FlixPass, we are finalizing proof of concept. For example, we just finalized with a large payment service provider owned by a very large Spanish bank, and by January 2024, we will have already 100K of annual recurring revenues. Thanks, uh, it's five seconds left, and I will be happy to take the questions from the jury. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Let's hope my microphone's on. Yes, it is. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that one. Uh, judges, Rafael, if you want to kick us off with questions. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Uh, Rafa from Excel here. So was quite curious about your ideal customer profile. What yeah. do you have in mind? Yeah, uh, so being very short, um, we are looking at enterprise merchants on one side, so companies that are having multiple payment service providers. We look as well at digital merchants a lot because by definition they have a lot of connections. Some studies, investigations, they look at companies that are having more than four different gateways. And we are starting to work as well with payment service providers because they need to provide intelligence to merchants. There obviously it takes more time for us because it's financial institutions, longer sales cycle. Thank you. Um, building in payments is actually pretty, uh, pretty hard. So congrats and, uh, and kudos to going into that segment. It's super exciting. Thank you. Um, and congrats also for building a product that's already out there. Can you share a bit what a Flixbus does um, today with the product? Um, cannot give you all the details, obviously, but I can tell you that they have multiple payment service provided globally and internally there was a struggle to collect all the data. Uh, there is a lot of fragmentation in payments data. So companies, they might have 23% availability, but we help them to reach 100%, which means that now they have state-of-the-art payment reconciliation, cost management, and all the things that they didn't have before. Cool. Do we have time for one more question? One minute um, and 20 seconds. Amazing. Uh, two questions in one then. Like, where today in that, usually what's the tech stack of the customers that you would sell into? Like, what kind of integrations would you need to do when where do you sit best? And then over time, how do you see Congrify developing within your kind of customer setup? Okay, first question. Uh, the beauty for us that once we connect to one data source or payment service provider, that connection can be used for any other one. So we are planning to have more than 50 by, by next year. And um, the second one, I can you just repeat because I can't hear it properly. Sorry, like where do you see like where do you see the product developing over time? Yeah, 
So the product will really go into the intelligence uh, part. So we are starting by building infrastructure, all the data collection. In the future, we want to be basically the co-pilot that manage, payment managers and payment specialists will use in their daily operations. We still have time for one quick question. <clears throat> Maybe you just share a bit about where your team is based and like any open yeah. roles you have in the next six months. Um, I'm personally based in Munich, Germany. Uh, Alex Durkov is German, based in Munich as well. And Alex Timoshenko is a Canadian citizen based in Amsterdam. So we plan to stay in Europe. But our outreach is global. I mean, the customers are, can be reached anywhere. Fantastic. Let's give a warm round of applause <clears throat> for Marco. Thank you. Great. That was one down, 19 to go. Next up, we're going to have uh, Alter Climate. And from Alter, we're going to have Cedric coming on stage, who flew in all the way from Canada to just pitch on this stage to you and the audience. Cedric is a very expertised person in his industry. And what he really wants to do is he wants to help organizations understand how to strategically manage the financial impact of climate change to each of your business models and your transactions. I'm going to walk off again, but please make Cedric feel very welcome. So give a warm round of applause to Cedric. Thank you. We have entered the era of global boiling, a human tragedy that poses an important financial risk to asset owners and investors in real assets. In 2022 alone, Climate-related catastrophic losses amounted to a staggering $299 billion. And 42% of these losses were uninsured. Yet, the vast majority of investors and asset owners in real assets continue to ignore the impacts of climate risks. They ignore the direct impacts of climate risks on their assets, and they ignore the, direct Im the indirect and systemic impacts of climate risks on their business model and revenue generation. An example. An investor wants to buy a resort near a national park. Without climate intelligence, this investor ignores the fact that the resort itself is exposed to both windstorms and wildfire risks. This investor ignores the direct impacts of climate risks. But this investor also ignores the fact that the natural park that drives its occupancy is also exposed to the same windstorms and wildfire risks, that the airport that guarantees the flow through of its clients will see interruptions because of wildfire smoke, and that the energy providers will see dry spells and shut down as a result of systemic climate risk. This investor is ignoring the impacts of climate risks on this investment. The outcome? overvaluation of the resort, and predictable financial losses. This nonsense has to stop. Far too much value is at risk. Enters Alter Climate. Alter is an AI-driven climate data platform built for investors and asset managers to deliver systemic climate information. It intersects open source with acquired scientific data with business model, infrastructure, and supply chain information to provide a systemic view of climate risk. How does it work? Investors upload their asset into Alter. Alter maps out the systems view and intersects climate data using its proprietary AI technology, and investors get actionable insights at their fingertips. Alter helps investors comply with regulations, manage current and forward-looking risks, and may enhance risk-adjusted returns. But better yet, Alter can be mined for opportunities that can be bundled into funds to raise new capital from capital markets. Alter is a SaaS, a spin-off of Clearsome, a climate advisory firm, and it benefits from its client base. We will continue building partnerships with consultancies, though our focus is increasingly on building our pipeline of direct sales. Because we see an important $4 billion gap in the marketplace. And while the competition can say all sorts of things about the direct impacts of climate risks on assets, it cannot do much more, because it is also ignoring the systemic impacts of climate risks, alter secret sauce. We have a deep and savvy team of experienced entrepreneurs that have expertise in climate, data, finance, policy, and risk management. And my co-founder and I have both successfully exited from companies in data and analytics and ESG and renewable energy, and we're empowering this team to succeed. 
In the last few months, we've launched our MVP, we've signed our first annual recurring client and delivered a number of mandates with consulting partners, and we've built an interesting pipeline of qualified leads with demo in hands. And today, I'm here to raise a $3 million seed round, Canadian dollars, to reach $1.2 million in ARR in an 18-month period. These funds will, sp will be spent wisely in product and technology and sales and marketing. At Alter Climate, our vision is to integrate two or three variables of systemic climate risk information in every cash flow statement in the world that supports a revenue projection, an investment, or a credit application. My name is Cedric Robert. This is Alter Climate. Join us. Thank you. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Luke. I know you're. Ah, just but okay. Let's see. Tied to the parent company. Is it a wholly owned sub subsidiary? What, what's the relationship? And yeah, the owns a portion of the the uh, the uh, of Alter Climate. However, Alter is an independent company. It's been an independent company since uh, well a year now, or just over a year, and the IP is entirely owned by this uh, the entity. Hi. Uh, Hi. First of all, congratulations. This is super exciting. Um, you mentioned both open source and different types of data. Can you help us understand? how much data is proprietary, how much is open, um, and what makes the data that you're using unique to drive these investment decisions? Absolutely. We use scientific models that are not ours. We're not climate modelers. And we use the data from the, own, from the clients that we bring on board. What we do is we use a knowledge graph and AI technology to map out the dependencies and evaluate the criticalities between those data. So it's built on the architecture of open source data, but the intelligence is sitting well inside the organization. Thank you so much for a great pitch. Do you want to walk us through like how your customers would actually use the platform and the insights? Like what type of insights is this? What type of like day-to-day, -day, weekly, monthly usage would you see for the kind of initial use cases? Certainly. So first and foremost, it's a data as a service provider. And the, in, the, the point that we're, what we're developing right now is working with the investment teams of an asset manager and an investment management team. So they get a data feed. That data feed feeds in directly into their investment process. What we do with it is that they look at their portfolio, they look at the distribution of their assets, and then as they do origination, due diligence deals, they start bringing in new data to look at what, is it, what does it do to the overall portfolio, what does it identify as being outliers that may be disposed of or integrated into the solution. They do the same thing moving forward in the investment process where they do deep due diligence before they actually proceed to an acquisition. So it's a on-demand need, look at their portfolio, score their assets, manage their assets accordingly. The idea here is to try to tease out long-term forward-looking risks so that they see hotspots on their portfolios. One more question? I had a quick one. Um, on the competitive landscape, are there other companies doing this? I think there's one called One Concern, I know, is uh, doing something similar to what it sounds like you're building. How do you view the competitive landscape? Well, there's a, a number of competitors that are in the direct bit risk business, but the systemic view is something that is really nascent, actually. We haven't seen much in the landscape that actually moves into that lens because it is, it is quite complex to understand. We're starting our first foray looking at systemic view of one type of, of industries, and we haven't seen anything like it, actually. I'd be happy to show you what a systemic view looks like after this. Fantastic, let's give a huge round of applause. Thank you. Amazing, that's two down, 18 to go. We're going really, really quick right now. Next up, we have Gaia Technologies and the founder, Janina, hopping on the stage. Gaia is very interesting because they're bringing AI and legal tech together. So all the legal tech companies in the building today, you wouldn't have to get an in-house legal team, you could use Gaia instead. Please give a warm round for Janina. Hi, I'm Janina, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Gaia Technologies, the first fully digital legal in-house counsel for medium-sized companies. So, what could you achieve if you had 20% more time? This is Alex. And Alex is running a thriving marketing business in Berlin. He grew it to 120 employees 
and he got there because of his creativity and his ability to con convince customers. But as the company got bigger, so did the pile of admin tasks on his desk, and especially legal stuff. So he is doing like contracts, compliance, legal questions of his team. It's taking up 20% of Alex's work week, at least. So it's eating into the time he should be spending doing the things he's actually really good at. So Alex should hire a legal counsel, right? But he just can't seem to find one. And there's a reason for that. There's just not enough qualified lawyers for medium-sized companies to hire. So take Germany, for example. We have tens of thousands of medium-sized businesses in Germany. And we only have a handful of lawyers to hire for them. So 10 out of 11 medium-sized companies in Germany have to somehow survive without legal in-house expertise. And this is the same problem in other places too, and it's getting even more problematic with each new law and regulation coming out. So I was a lawyer in the past, and I simply had to do something about this problem. So I decided to build Gaia, the first digital in-house council for mid-sized companies. It's a complete product for all the legal needs of medium-sized companies, and it's driven by AI. So a company like Alex can now take care of the legal tasks easily. They can create, sign, store, and understand legal documents, and they can ask legal questions and get the right answers. So everything they would usually hand over to a legal in-house counsel, they can now do with a platform. And why did Alex have to wait so long for the solution? So in the past, we just really had the problem that we could not compute legal knowledge and that we had to set up like a data-driven system for that. And now, as we all know, things changed a bit. So see, law is logic and it's stored in human language. So as we all know, it's one of the biggest use cases for large language models. So now for the first time, we can actually make legal work way more efficient or even replace the human behind it. And there is another topic, like why this has not been built before. You need a very special set of skills to be able to build that. And we have this in our team. My years of legal expertise, working both as a lawyer and a legal counsel, and my co-founder, Ben, who has built data-driven tech products for many years before. So together we built this product, the first version of it. We released it in April, and we already sold it to large German scale-ups like Tourloin, Grover, Sanity, and 30 other companies. And we are now ready to scale this even further and build a real global champion, and also give all of you back 20% of your time. So for all the companies out there, Gaia is not just a service, it's ease of mind. So please join us in the legal revolution. Go for it. I see you waiting with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janina. It's a great, uh, great pitch. I was quite curious to understand your tech stack. What are you, you know, using on the AI side? So, like, obviously, like, we're building first, like, the whole structure of everything. Um, and then, like, like the, from the AI side, it's really, like, working with GPTs and then, like, different tools we use. Because we have, like, some stuff uh, where we can use, like, Google, like, really efficiently because it gives us the answers of, like, um, some of the data where we really want to know how sure and exact is like the answer if we really give out and hand out this data points. And then obviously when it comes to really chatting like with our interface and the Slack integration, um, like it's building like on, on ChatGPT and we are like answering with that. Thank you for the great pitch. As a fellow German, uh, <laughs> I can underwrite that we have a quite a lot of challenge in the, our legal system with notaries, for example. So yeah. it's great that someone finally tackles it. What I'd be curious to understand is often you hire a legal counsel or a law firm as a security net against litigation because it just gives you peace of mind. 
Do you think that at, with Gaia you'll somehow work together with external legal counsel? Where's the boundary for yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. There's some specific work where it absolutely makes sense to hire external law firms. We're really tackling the, product, the, the problem where you're usually having like an in-house legal team. And they also hire external lawyers many times. That give, even gives us an advantage because we work together with law firms. You can invite your lawyer to our platform and that even helps us to get like faster to the market because we're not saying, okay, we're replacing a transaction lawyer doing an M&A transaction or a complex litigation case, but all the stuff I hated to do when I was an associate and had to, like somebody calls me and gives me like 400 euro an hour to handle some kind of shareholder resolution or managing their legal data. They should do that internally and there's no service for that in law firms. They don't want to do it. Cool. Um, outside in, I think the space is perceived as relatively crowded. Um, so how do you feel you stack up against competition and kind of where do you see your main points or main vectors of differentiation? Yeah, especially like when it comes to medium-sized businesses and this exact problem of in-house counsels and replacing them, we don't see that at crowded, as crowded yet. Like there are a lot of contract management systems, especially also in the enterprise and stuff. And that's like we don't tackle that problem. It's like really forming like one unified system where you can also answer legal questions without needing like an in-house human to be able to use this tool. And there we see like many also AI companies really tackling to sell to general counsels. We do just the opposite. So we are really tackling the firms who don't have this in-house like team. Hey Janina, um, if I'm a small business owner, how do I discover you today? So, um, first of all, yeah, we have our website, we're doing some CEO, so we need to like, increase that even more. We're doing a lot of LinkedIn um, like go-to-market stuff, we're doing outreach, um, and now we're tackling this even more, like building like, small use cases and products together with law firms, um, so they discover this more quickly, and also like, accountants and other people like, will bring this to, to, the, to the companies. And if there's like, one very common pain point that people come, you, come to you for, where, where do we start? Um, many people have a lot of legal work in HR, and that's really expensive after a while. So many like HR teams start to use us first and then spread this out more. But we really like work with the C-level. So like the CFO from Tourlane, who just has so many different legal struggles. And like for him, it's natural now uh, to just come, come to us. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Give a warm round for Janina. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have a Amsterdam-based company called Shy. Please welcome Leonardo, who is aiming to tackle the inefficiency of a growing 120 billion euro industry. He's going to share more about it next. Warm round. Um, today, I want to talk to you about movies and ads. And I would like to show uh, you some problems about the industry that maybe you never really thought about. And specifically, I want to talk to you about pre-production of movies and ads. Uh, and in pre-production, the problem is that the most creative people often have to handle the most boring and time-consuming tasks. We say it's like go hiring Gordon Ramsay to actually make a ham and cheese toast. But before going into it, I'll introduce you to us. Uh, it's myself and Jeroen. As founders, we are a team of creative and techies. And we are supported by uh, one of the best photographers in the world and now one of the best AI creators in the world, Edu. So let's define pre-production. And what we mean with pre-production, everything is, is going from visual, visualizing, planning, and budgeting a, a creative idea. And it doesn't really matter what type of content is being created from a product video to the next Netflix season, pre-production covers a huge and expensive part of production of content. And the big problem is that the current solution really don't cut it. Uh, they're very expensive, uh, very difficult to use, they require very complex training. So our target audience still uses Excel and Google Sheets, make it very analog and time expensive. And this is a bit how the landscape looks like of our competitors. And in an industry that is continuously growing, uh, this inefficiency that is estimated to be about 30% means that most of the budget is lost during the content production process. And the big opportunity here is that right now we are talking about uh, professional uh, production studios, but in a world where everyone with a phone and enough creativity can actually produce 
professional, high quality content, uh, not only professional studio, but any digital content creator can actually become our user. So we set up to build the first uh, pre AI pre-production workflow to make everything uh, at least 20 times as faster. Meaning that we can go from a pre-production that will take days and cost hundreds of thousands of euros to actually be able to make it in minutes and with a monthly subscription. We do it by up applying artificial intelligence to the different steps of the pre-production process. We start by uploading a script and extracting all the relevant uh, data to make uh, storyboards and visualizing an idea. This is something that usually will take days, but thanks to extrapolating data such as location, casting, camera work, lightning, etc., we're actually able to do it in seconds. Uh, we then compile everything together in a shot list, uh, even crafting a specific time for each shot, so our users are able to understand how long it's going to take to shoot that specific scene, and then compile everything together into a uh, production planning thanks to our AI-created model. And in the future, we envision shy to actually become a virtual AI producer, so every, uh, able to give to the user answers uh, to production questions. So far, since we started in May, uh, as we got together, uh, we right now have, uh, actually here is four, but now we have five as of today, uh, design partnership uh, programs going with uh, production studios ranging from uh, 1,000 employees to actually boutique studios of only 10 employees. We have worked in the Netherlands with some of the biggest brands, uh, and we have Antler as our preceding investor. As I said, we are now finishing up the beta by this year and launching Shy uh, at the beginning of 2024 and optimizing for digital content creators um, in Q2 next year. And this is how we plan on revolutionizing pre production of content and movies and ads. Thank you. And here we go, three minutes of questions. Go for it, Luke. Um, so two, two part question. The first one, can you, uh, what level of, of like production quality are you trying to service? Is this like indie studios, lower budget um, productions, or is this like very, very high end? And then how do you think about pricing? Yeah, good question. Um, to, fully be, to be fully honest, this is still something we have figured out what is the best agency or type of client to work with. Right now we see that uh, companies that create uh, a lot of content, so in terms of quantity, so more advertising studios and uh, brands with in-house studios um, actually are more in need of this sort of, con on this sort of uh, software uh, because they work on very big scales rather than big quantities, but, or big, um, oh, sorry, of just big quality of campaigns. So actually projects, they happen very, very frequently. Um, so can you repeat the second question, sorry? Um, how do you think about pricing? It's kind of tied to the type of customer you're going yeah, for. So. Yeah, yeah, so uh, uh, right now we, uh, also with the design partners, basically with the ROI that we signed, uh, we set at a price of 300 euros per user, so 200, actually 290 euros per user. We don't know if that's going to be uh, the right pricing, uh, but we know that even that will be already a huge saving from uh, uh, usually something that will cost 1,200 euros a day in terms of pre-production in man hours. Are you ripping out and replacing the entire stack that they're using today, or you're working in conjunction with the workflow? I think in the future we'll be in conjunction with the workflow, because some of these tools uh, work for a specific part of the process, and I don't think we should, tr we should trash that way. However, we talk with more than 150 people uh, in the advertising industry. That's my background. I've been a producer for five or six years. And uh, no one uses anything in Google Sheets and Excel. Uh, but there is still value in other tools that, for example, in the movies industries are using. So we're trying to combine our expertise with our technology with something that already exists and give to the users something that basically plug and play. Um, I can work with it right away. Do we have a final question? Rafa, go ahead, or Alex. Um, thanks for the pitch. So how much of your go-to market will be focused on the US? Uh, right now, we're just focusing in uh, Europe, to be honest, because the market is already big enough. And right now, we still want to understand where exactly we bring the most value. US will be a huge market for us, uh, so especially New York and, uh, and California. 
but I would say probably more in New York because that's where more, most advertising agencies are and we feel right now that's where most of the value is coming from for us. Fantastic questions. Thank you for the questions and thank you, Leonardo. Thank you. Whew. How are we feeling? We've had a few down. Are we still good to keep the momentum? Yeah, some nods. Okay. Next up, we have a line. And from a line, we have George who's going to come on and share about their customer feedback intelligence platform for growth stage companies. Give a huge round for them. Hi, my name is George, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Align. Align helps B2B product teams understand what their customers care about at scale. In my previous company, I led the go-to-market team as we grew from zero to 200 customers. Naturally, I spent most of my time talking to our customers, and at some point evolved into this almost like human feedback filter between our customers and their product team. But as we kept growing, we added more channels, more people, different types of customers, and finding anything actionable became super tough. Our team spent a ton of time on feedback, but in reality, when we wanted to answer anything like what matters to this user segment, we struggled, and we missed out on opportunities because of this. Align is building software that automatically detects product feedback across all of your customer conversations. We integrate with the tooling that you use to interact with your customers, like your CRM, support tool, stack. We extract the meaning behind what customers are saying, and we make it searchable for your product team. Our platform enables you to dig deeper into any trends or specific topics that you care about. You can quickly get an understanding of the user segments that are impacted and the revenue impact that is there uh, associated with every topic. Now, for our early customers, we already save about 60 hours each month on automatic capture alone. But that's just the beginning. If you think about how we understand our customers' product experience, Today, we traditionally look at events, the actions that product customers are taking in our product. I'd argue that with the rise of large language models and growth in text-based data, this balance is shifting a bit between quantitative and qualitative. What makes me really excited about building a line is this thesis that if we can connect who your customers are, what they tell you, and how they behave, we can build exponentially better products. Let's play through a scenario. Say that uh, conversion is dropping at a specific part of your product. Now, what if instead of spending days or weeks kind of connecting the dots why that might be, you could get to an answer or a, at least a hypothesis on why that is instantly based on the conversations, the impact that customers are having with your team. Align enables companies to go from where something is happening to why it's happening and focus on the highest impact opportunities. Now, our core user is the product team because they sort of dictate where the product is going. Over the past six months, we've spoken to more than 100 scale-up product leaders and understood that while most of the tooling in the space focuses on building a full cycle, sort of full stack tool for them, Actually, what they need is to deeply understand what their customers care about and to understand the impact that anything that they ship has on the customers and the business. Our target customer is a mid-market B2B company. Uh, say Series A+, plus, usually a mix of product-led, sales-led growth. And since going live in September with first customers, we have already onboarded some of the leading scale-ups in Europe, like Moss and Katana, to our platform. Finally, who are we? We're a team of four, uh, and we're building the product that we wish we had access to when we were leading product and CX teams back in companies like Wise and Verif. We're a team that believes that while so building software is getting easier and easier, building software that matters for your customers is not. We're here to make that happen. Thank you. That was on the dot three minutes. Well done. Perfect. Luke. 
Alex, almost. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, you look alike. Uh, it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> we have kind of grey shirts. Yes. Um, thank you, George. I think we in Europe, as a startup ecosystem, still have to prove that we can build great products on a wider extent. So everything that that pushes this forward uh, is close to my heart. You had on your slide already product board. Um, in one of them, I'd uh, love to understand a little bit how you differentiate exactly in contrast to that product. Because if I understand their vision correctly, they're trying to kind of go after this as well, right? Yeah. Uh, good question. Thank you. Uh, so product board has traditionally been. Oh, okay. Sorry, slide went up. Anyway, product board has uh, traditionally been more like a planning and delivery tool. So basically, pulling all together all things from internal teams and your customers and trying to like kind of. Uh, build like this into this planning cycle. Where we focus on is, first of all, the differentiation with Procport comes from automated capture. So we automatically analyze the conversations and pull that information there so we don't rely on the teams to actually submit it. Uh, but also we automatically tie it together with a, your CRM parameters. So essentially, we, that's why we kind of also focus on B2B companies more, uh, so that we can have we can kind of like analyze the data by user segments, revenue impact automatically, and and give your product teams the under, like an in-depth understanding of of who these customers are. So the question is a bit different. Uh, we don't necessarily approach it from like how do you build this, but rather we're trying to give you an explicit understanding of how your customers experience the product. Um, thank you for a great pitch. Do you want to, and very impressive like early adopters logos, yeah. um, do you want to walk us through your kind of go to market motion and how you think about that, both kind of in the short term, but also yeah. like beyond the seed round? Sure. Um, so, so far, uh, we, what we did was that we initially built design partnerships with a couple of companies. Then in September, we started doing actual pilots with uh, some of the companies and logos that you saw there. Uh, these are paid pilots. Uh, we do them for three months and basically then try to adjust the software to uh, sort of fit the mold for their company. But uh, in terms of go to market, given that this is still a relatively tight integration that's needed and we need another single person can just go and like set things up, we uh, need to get legal buy in and so forth. It's been typically founder led sales so far. That said, one of the interesting things that we can do to actually prevent a lot of the like, upfront legal hurdle is we can pull in all public sources and uh, enable you to already get um, value from like, public review sites, uh, App Store, Google Store, and so forth. And this has this like, nice type of, sort of showing value before you uh, actually sell it back. Cool. Fantastic questions. Let's give a warm round again. Thank you. Up next, we have a really cool company called Amber Search. And their founder, Philip, is going to come on stage and share why their AI search tool that knows all the company data that you might have is exactly the one to win Sush 100. Give a warm round for them. Thank you, Marco, and a warm welcome to everyone here in Helsinki. I'm Philip, and I'm really excited to present to you Amber Search. The problem that we are solving with Amber Search tackles millions of workers in Germany alone. So, how do you spend your time as a knowledge worker? More than 20% of your time is just wasted looking for information. And why is it so hard to solve it? Because on average, every knowledge worker uses at least four to six different tools every day. And the tools are quite different. You have the messaging tools, you have the document management systems, and you have the issue tracker, support tools, intranet tools. And to really give meaningful answers, you need to combine the information from all of these tools. And that's exactly what we are doing with Ember Search. By really sticking to the UX that you are known from Google and from ChatGPT, you feel at home in the first second. So we can onboard the users, uh, the people, with literally no effort and combine all of the information, whether it's visual information, text information, uh, videos, into one single result page that you have at your fingertips in split seconds. And the best thing is, we can also combine all of these information to generate an answer and provide you an AI bot where you can really have the full knowledge of your company behind. Who's we? The founder team, Igli, who graduated top in his class in computer science, Basti, 
who um, comes from an entrepreneurial family and me um, who founded his first startup um, at the age of 19. We have over 1,000 active users already generating over now 250,000 ARRs. So last week until I submitted it went pretty well. Um, now 100 million documents index growing at approximately 500,000 documents per day. And for every one of those documents, that's our secret sauce. We know exactly which user has access to view it and to read it. So we really know what you should see and what you shouldn't see um, when you're the intern versus when you are the CEO. The market that we are tackling is the mid-sized companies ranging from 50 to 1,000 employees and we are currently focusing on the B-Check market, Germany alone, engineering companies because that's where we feel at home and where we see a limited number of tools and a repetitive IT environment where we can easily integrate. We are starting there with one department at 700 MRR and then um, upselling it to over 2,000 MRR after a couple of months when we roll it out to the whole company. We also just established partner sales, um, closed our first contracts through them. And that's not where we end. So we started with the search, then we are generating the knowledge and Another 10x improvement here in the efficiency will come when we actively recommend you the information whenever you need it. Because right now, you're still losing information because you're not, not triggering the search at the right point. And based on these recommendations, we can also enable you to drive better decisions because we know literally everything that is in your company and that you are currently working on. And besides these long-term milestones, we also have short-term milestones we want to achieve. So we are currently not demand limited, but sales team limited. So we want to grow our sales team to six full-time employees by mid of next year, then generating over 80,000 liquidity per month. We still um, want to improve our AI functionalities to still be at the forefront of technology there. So to keep our step ahead of the competition and we also want to automate and speed up the customer journey because customer success is key. Anyone can throw in AI tools but it's really um, to provide the use cases for the employers. And if you want to speak with me or my team, find me at the German booth. Let's get straight to the questions. Is that our microphone? No. Sorry. Go ahead. OK. Uh, thanks for the pitch. A nice uh, jumper, by the way. So quick question. What is the um, biggest heavy lift you had to do on the tech side uh, in terms of integration and so on? Um, you mean by connecting to the applications? Um, so as we are limited to specific domains, we can quite re reduce the number of tools we need to connect. So we have. 25 standard connectors that we have and everything else uh, can be fed in to our open API. So if you have a very individual tool, um, which is kind of rare in our target group, that's also why it's a very nice target group to sell to mid-sized companies, um, you can still feed it in through our open APIs. Um, can, can you talk just your view of the competitive landscape? Because I know there's a large company in the US thing called Glean that's mm -hmm. the, um, been doing this for a few years and there's a, there's actually a few in the Nordics. How do you differentiate against what's in the market today? I mean, Glean is largely focusing on, on the larger enterprises where you also have as a downside um, more individualization. So there comes the first question back into play, whereas we are tackling really like the mid-sized enterprises that only have off-the-shelf tools and where you can really scale very well. And then can you just talk a bit about what applications have you integrated with today um, and what, what are you have on the roadmap for the next 12 months? Um, so right now it's mostly DMS tools like the one that the German Mittelstand is using so develop uh, easy and so on like of course the Microsoft tools the intranet tools Halo staff base and so on uh, currently we are rolling out the CRM so Salesforce um, uh, Dynamics um, and HubSpot and then we will move it on further to, to ERP tools in, in the future. Any more questions? Alex? No? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Let's give a warm round of applause again for Amber Search. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Fantastic.
Next up, we have a company called Clip, but I want to just remind everybody we have four more companies before we take a break. So four more, and then it's time for a break. So what does Clip do? Maximilian, the founder, is going to share more about it. But actually, I have a joke to share. Who loves to read long text manuals for anything at work? See, no hands came up. And that's exactly what Clip is going to be working on. They're working on um, interactive video guides for the workplace. Give a huge round of applause for Clip. Hi, I am Max, co-founder. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? No? Sorry, the mic is not working. Yeah, no, it's working. OK, sorry. Hi, I am Max, co-founder of Clip. Clip enables everybody to create and share visual how-to guides in minutes. YouTube is a huge part of my life. When I don't know how to do something, I look it up on YouTube. And so do over 2 billion people every month. But when we look at our work, knowledge bases have not changed for the last 20 years. Our work instructions look pretty much like this. Tons of Word documents hidden in confusing folder structures. This leads to lots of repeating questions, phone calls, and IT tickets. But these times are over. Clip makes knowledge sharing fun. We built the first smart visual knowledge hub, a YouTube for businesses. With Clip, anyone can create a high-quality how-to guide with our automated video creation tool. The tutorials are then stored on an intelligent central platform, which recommends the right content at the right time. Of course, the tutorials can be seamlessly integrated in any tool of daily work, like Microsoft Teams. And the platform provides actionable insights into actuality, popularity, and relevancy of the content. Remember the time when text content dominated? Think of Confluence, SharePoint, and millions of paper manuals. Well, work has changed. People have to keep track of hundreds of workflows. This is why they turn to video to explain things to each other. But video calls and Loom recordings are not suitable to explain things to many people, because they are often long, lack in quality, and cannot be updated. Clip is the visual knowledge base for all employees, and here's why. High quality content. Our customers generate hundreds of views. They demand high quality. This is why clips are automatically branded, transcribed, and translated in any language. But processes and products change. This is why the platform features smart actuality checks, version control, and reminders. And speaking of change, have you ever tried to re-edit an existing video? Well, let me tell you, it's a hassle. Clips are super easy to update through a modular and AI-first approach. And the right time for Clip is now. The market for video documentation and training is huge. The imminent challenge of retiring baby boomers puts knowledge sharing on the top of C-level agendas. This is why the market is even growing to 69 billion euros in 2030. And the best thing is, Customers already love Clip. Within only 17 months and a super lean team, we grew from zero to 300K in ARR, and we convinced 20 customers, like Telefonica, to boost their onboardings, support, trainings, and documentation with Clip. And we are the right team to take on this big opportunity. Before founding Clip, my co-founder Edwin and I consulted big companies on their knowledge management strategies and execution. Together with our experienced full-stack developer, Hitanj, we combine operational expertise and obsessive product focus. We are complemented by four exceptional experts in design, front-end, finance, and operations. Together, we leverage the power of video and make it available to everybody. Because from today on, it's simple. Thank you. I think we can just kick off. Uh, there's Marco. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Go for it. Um, uh, so a few questions on the go-to-market. Uh, yeah. ACVs today, how are you pricing it? Um, and then is this a lot of outbound or is it inbound sales motion? Uh, mm -hmm. so maybe start there. Yeah. So ACVs right now are around 20,000 euros. Um, the go-to-market is focused on medium-sized companies, 
starting at 200 employees, going up to 2,000 for our first, um, first go-to-market motion. And we focus on knowledge-heavy industries, which have also a high turnover of employees. For example, manufacturing, where they have to onboard new people all the time in different languages. Um, but also insurances, who have complex products that need to be explained all over again. Thank you, Max. Yeah. Um, I think we have all seen cumbersome product documentation or knowledge that we couldn't yeah. access and find. For example, such as finding this stage for me this morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you tried your best. <laughs> Um, why did you specifically focus on internal knowledge sharing versus outside product documentation or mm -hmm. security uh, sharing, so stuff like that? Mm -hmm. It actually was a little bit historically. Our first customers in the medium-sized segment, they had this big generational change problem. They said our biggest problem today is to keep the knowledge from the people who are going out of the company, in the company, and onboarding the young ones who we already have pr uh, struggles to find. And that was our first... Um, pain point that we realized and that had immediate value to our, to our clients. Of course, now, when they have used the product a little, they also now implement it for documentations for their customers to explain their machines, their software better. So we are on that track already. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's actually a category we, we actually like a lot. We invest is in, in Syntesia that does it with kind yeah. of avatars. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, could you walk us through like a use case, you know, how one mm -hmm. of your customers is using it, what have you learned, what have they seen on their side? Yeah, yeah. So typical use case right now for a customer is they implement a new ERP system. And the training department can do videos but they don't know anything about the ERP system. The, the department who is implementing it has to come up with an implementation plan and onboardings quickly, and there we come in. We create the urgency, of course, with that, and then they can, by themselves, create short video guidances for their people without the need that anybody has to do it, and we already have a huge uh, base of viewers, because almost everybody is using the ERP system in such a company, um, that are already used to, okay, if uh, uh, John can do those videos, I can do it myself for my department, and then we spread in the company and upsell on the licenses. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for the question, and thank you, Maximilian. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we got three more to go before the break, so just sit tight. Next up, we have Ida from Silo Team. Silo Team is on a mission to make developer onboarding, offboarding, and retention seriously simple. So give a huge round of applause for Ida. Hello, everyone. My name is Ida, and I'm one of the founders of Silo Team. And we have made developer on and offboarding and retention seriously simple. The problem is clear. Developers have one of the highest turnover rates among all occupations. And this costs companies billions of dollars every year. But the question is, why do they leave? Well, there are several reasons for this. Everything from getting stuck in knowledge silos, limited automation, or understanding tech stack and tools. So basically, there are significant challenges throughout the entire life cycle of a developer. But clearly, spreadsheets, Jira tickets, and endless Slack threads is not working. But we are solving this and saving companies tons of money. We will be the go-to tool for retaining developers, and we're starting by attacking the most urgent pain points first. A streamlined technical onboarding that really shortens the time to productivity. An AI-powered learning management system that revolutionizes technical knowledge sharing. And a fast and secure offboarding. So imagine that you can detect situations that have a negative impact in through retention, or that you can support your tech teams by answering questions that might hinder them from doing their job. Using AI and automation, we can save time and boost productivity. But why is now the right time to build this? Well, with the recent economic downturn, there has never been a better time to start retaining your top talent. 
developers are arguably business's most important and costly asset. The interest is already enormous. We have hundreds of beta signups from all over the world from CTOs and engineering managers. We also have several very strong POC agreements with companies fitting our ICP, and all of them has an effective payment they attach to it. But we're just scratching the surface. We're targeting companies with larger tech teams worldwide, starting here in Europe, then expanding to APAC and North America. How will we go to market? Well, product-led growth is absolutely our main strategy. We're getting early users from the mid-market and Europe. We are looking into strategies similar to Slack's, where their focus will be on user-driven growth and product adoption. The market is certainly heating up, and we believe that there's only a matter of time when indirect competitors become direct competitors. But currently, our solution is not available on the market, causing team fragmentation, knowledge silos, and developers departing. We charge per seat, split by stakeholders and developers, with pricing tiers based on company size and usage. Decision makers and the budgets are 100% on the tech side. This is our team. We are the right team to build this company because we have first-hand experience with the problem space. We're also covering the entire spectrum from technical to commercial. We have a clear path ahead. We're looking for partners and investors who truly understand the problem space and can facilitate connections with tech teams. Start retaining your top talents. Join us today. Thank you. Exciting. <laughs> Judges. Yeah, tusen tack. Tack. Um, very exciting to uh, to hear about your plans. Do you want to walk us through kind of what is it that gets kind of customer hooked at that kind of initial conversations you're having? And then what, what do you think will make them stay over time? So first of all, I would say that the problem is very expressed by the target customers. Uh, so um, so far, for example, all the users and POC agreements has been inbounds, and this really shows that this is a not, not a nice tool to have, but more of a must tool to have, right? Um, so um, um, the stickiness point of your product, so we cover the entire life cycle of a developer from start, retaining, and then finishing by offboarding. So we keep them by providing it throughout the entire uh, employment. And do you do you have any, uh, any customers today, or how, where are you at in the go-to-market process? So we are pre-launch, a couple of months from launching, but we have hundreds of beta signups from all over the world and several very strong POC agreements with companies that are fitting the ICP that we have, but also all of the pricing tiers. Um, and all of them has an effective payment day, so it would turn into revenue whilst the pilot period is over. One thing I might add here is that we had a 100% conversion rate going into the POC agreements. So for me as a salesperson, that's like the best you can have because that, that actually shows once again that it is a must tool to have. Hey, onboarding and offboarding for developers is quite different company to company. What level of customization you're providing today in, in the product and, or how do you, you know, plan to integrate that over time? So it's very straightforward going into the platform. So there are templates uh, that are community-generated best practices for how you should onboard certain tech roles. So let's say you want to onboard a full-stack developer, you just use that template. So the only customization and like implementation you need, the first time you log into the silo team platform as a responsible stakeholder, is basically to assign the stakeholder responsibilities so everyone knows what to do and when and then include all of the dev tools that, that you have within your tech team. We got time for one more good question. No? All right. Give a huge round of applause for Silo team. <laughs> if you're good in math, you know that we have two more left before the 15-minute break. Next up, we have Lua Health. And we're going to have Fion, uh, sorry if I butchered the name, Fion, uh, the co-founder and CEO coming to share why they do what they do. And what do they do 
is they are disrupting the current approach to employee well-being by introducing proactive and guess what, AI-powered solutions. Let's give a huge round of applause. Did you know that 61% of attrition in the workplace is due to poor mental health? My name is Fionn, I'm CEO and co-founder at Lua Health, and we've already helped hundreds of employees improve their well-being in the workplace. We've hit an inflection point in corporate wellness. Companies are spending more than ever on well-being in the workplace, but the workplace is also more stressed, depressed, and burnt out than they've ever been. And this is because we're throwing benefits at them, mindfulness apps, therapy apps, but no one's actually using them. The utilization remains on 4% on average. And it's because we've never innovated. We still just send out emails once a quarter, reminding people, here are the benefits you could be using. When we talk to the likes of Paul at AT&T, he tells us he doesn't need another benefit company. He needs a platform that gets the right benefits in front of the right employees at the right time. And at Lua, that's exactly what we do. We integrate into the likes of Teams or Slack. And our clinical AI platform analyzes text data and detects issues like stress, depression, and burnout. And then we proactively reach out to that employee and offer them the most appropriate benefits in that moment. And our vision is to become the front door and data platform for well-being in the workplace. In the future, expanding to a marketplace offering, as well as gathering objective data and trends on well-being in the workplace. And we live and breed privacy. As a psychologist, I'd hate to see your well-being data ever used against you in the workplace. This is why managers only ever see anonymized high-level statistics. We're also GDPR compliant and working to ISO security standards. And you can trust us because we've done this before. My name is Fionn, I'm a CEO, I'm a psychologist, and I previously led well-being at the largest mental health app until acquisition. My co-founder, Michal, he has a PhD in AI, and he's raised five million in EU projects. And Mark, he's an exited founder, and previously led sales, the likes of Oracle and Fujitsu. And from our advisory board, they led well-being at the likes of Meta and TikTok. And their fellow Irish founders, who went into the US market, scaled, exited, and won. And all this put together is why companies like InTouchDX trust us with the thorny problem of workplace well-being. We're currently deployed across three continents, and the results of our pilots, they're absolutely fantastic. 66% reduction in stress, increased productivity, decreased turnover, but most importantly, the employees themselves are giving us really high MPS scores. We wrap this all in a typical SaaS B2B offering at a price point of about $6 per person per month, and that price goes up when we do on-prem deployment or custom integrations. Now I know when you hear mental health, you probably think crowded market space. And for treatment providers, that's absolutely true. But screening and triage, that's a new market we aim to dominate. Although there are competitors in the likes of the Nordics here and in the States, they use different data gathering methods like Fitbits that lack the scalability and integration of our solution. Our beachhead market is content moderators, a growing field that is absolutely plagued by mental health issues. Once we're in the door there, and we're already there actually, we start to scale out to customer service agents and then upwards to all desk-based employees, targeting a total TAM of 3.4 billion. We recently closed our pre-seed round, but mental health and AI are at inflection points. And with support from you today at Slush, we could capitalize on those trends. We hope you'll join us in truly bringing proactive well-being to the workplace. Who's going to kick us off the questions? Yeah, I'll start. Thanks a lot for the pitch. It was awesome. Um, can I just ask one clarifying question? Do employees need to opt in to be reached out to? That's a great question. It's either or. So we allow the company to choose, and they can deploy it based on a different jurisdiction. So in Europe, it's always opt-in due to GDPR. But in North America and South America, it can be opt-out 
it's up to the company to decide. Super. And when you say that you have reduced stress, what are you using as a benchmark to measure that? We use standardized questionnaires, so kind of pre and post after eight week trials, after three month trials, standardized stress questionnaires. Super, thank you. And that's across your entire population? That's across the entire population that you've treated today? That's, a, yes, across the entire population. Okay, super. Yeah. And just to clarify, um, you, so where you sit is you're monitoring employee conversations in a secure way, and then based on what you see, if your software determines someone is burnt out or something, then you're going to recommend a benefit. What yeah. if the company doesn't have the right benefits? Are you like, do you also have a solution you can provide to the employee, or is that yeah. where the value so sort of we, drops? That's a great question. So we see a consultancy aspect to this, where we can have that marketplace of benefits behind us and go, hey, we noticed that. Yeah, you're really burnt out employees, but you don't have anything for that. Why don't you use our friends over here? And then we take a cut of that profit. And uh, thank you. Kind of as you scale beyond um, the POCs you have right now, how do you think you'll make the transition from being perceived as a perk to being like an actual kind of ROI driving solution? And what are the kind of the key metrics that you think you'll have to prove? That's a great question. So like, I'll be frank. Companies are hesitant to pay for better well-being. Companies want to pay for real KPIs, and that is attrition and productivity. And those are the KPIs from day one we've been targeting, and we've already shown better productivity and reduced turnover. So that's how we position ourselves, not just as yet another benefit, but a real KPI that their CEOs can go, yes, that, that, that I will pay for. We have one more? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for building in the space. Um, I think we as Ecosystem do a good job in really taking it front and center uh, uh, mental health now. However, trust is at the center, and you mentioned this already. So what are you doing with the employees of the organizations to really make them trust you as well? Because it sounds quite scary, if I'm being honest, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So again, from day one, we've, we've kind of, how do we stop this big brother aspect? How do we stop you thinking, yeah, you're, employed, you're kind of being monitored? So as part of our onboarding package with companies, we do what we call collaborative onboarding. So not just with the managers, but with the employees. How are we helping you monitor your own stress? You have a Fitbit, you monitor your like steps and stuff. Well, why can't you see your own stress in the world, work, workplace? And we have a dashboard, people can see graphs, they can compare themselves against their team. So there's a bit of a gamification aspect is here as well as drive engagement. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Fionn. We're now on our last company before the 15 minute break. Next up, we're going to welcome Ample. And some of the co founders are going to share why their solution is actually the correct product to improve public discussion in the future. Please welcome Ample. So, the traditional format of news has failed to engage audiences in a way that is needed today when information spreads to conversation. On social media, engagement is built on a type of virality that crowds out quality arguments. This has left the vast majority of audiences disappointed in their primary sources of information. We see that the future of staying informed is conversational, but should promote understanding instead of polarization. Our service is built to leverage the untapped potential in the scientific community and connect that with the public. The service seamlessly integrates into news media websites, delivering top of the line expert comments directly to the most intriguing questions from the public. Imagine reading a thought-provoking news article and having the world's leading scientist comment on your questions. Behind the scenes, our AI connects your questions to the most intriguing questions from the uh, public and connects those to the most relevant scientists. It does this by diving into the vast database of scientific knowledge and pinpointing the expert based on their research history. 
Scientists do want to share their expertise, but doing so in the current uh, social media platforms is extremely time consuming. As social media platforms concentrate more on uh, comments and user content, articles shared are given less prominence by algorithms. As Ample's content is shared as commentary, it performs better on social media. The comments keep the article relevant to the readers, but also to search engine algorithms, prolonging the lifetime of the article. The conversion of readers to subscribers and the value from advertising are the critical KPIs news companies focus on. We have designed the, the, our service to help with both. Ample's business model is based on increasing the traffic to news media clients and then increasing the value derived from time spent on the site. We tackle two key sources of traffic for our clients, organic search and social media. We seek to partner with key clients and integrate our service deeply with theirs, providing unrivaled content to their readers but also an untapped revenue potential to the media company. We have deep knowledge of the industry, but as industry outsiders, we can leverage new technologies and a new market of content creators without risking a legacy business model. We're building our uh, client base and a pool of scientists simultaneously by partnering with universities and regional media companies during a pilot program in the first half of 2024. This is designed to take advantage of the early momentum and interest into the service and prepare users for the platform. This will eventually grow into an active and working ecosystem that launches on selected media company sites later next year. Thank you. Thank you, Samsa. Maxi, go ahead. Thank you, and right name. Um, very thought-provoking and obviously super kind of relevant pitch and idea. How would you, like, how would you even kind of begin curating and making sure kind of the, the, the profile, the validity of the scientists on the platform? How do you kind of think about all the, you know, the risks kind of that yeah. are so imminent kind of outside in? Yeah. So. We're part, as I said, uh, we're partnering with universities and collaborating with them so that basically the scientists will be working for the universities and, and uh, have a, a position at the university. So, so basically uh, curating the pool of scientists with, in collaboration with, with the university. Yeah, but at the end of the day, like it's going to be on you whether the actual scientists are verified or not, right? So how would yes. you ensure that? Or would you just completely rely on the university? Yeah, basically this is kind of a two-sided platform. We're just concentrating more on the content creator side that is not uh, everyday people, but, but the scientific community. Um, how do you think about scalability? Is there, uh, is there enough supply in the like, expert community to satisfy all the you know, consumer <laughs> demand that if, you, if your platform starts to work and take off, yeah, yeah. is it, that a, a limiter? Uh, well, we actually don't think so. So basically, the content that the scientists uh, are, are, are providing the news companies, we can, we can deal with a, a pool of 500 uh, active scientists, and we can service our, our top 10 clients with, with 10 uh, uh, articles weekly. And we're basically intending this to be a, a service where we, we kind of uh, <laughs> provide them with uh, valuable expert content and, and sell that rather than a Q&A system where every question gets answered. So it's more of a content selling uh, point of view to the media companies. Hey, what is the uh, key incentive for the university to participate in the platform today? Uh, visibility. So we've, we've gotten a question about like how, how willing are the scientists to participate and the university and the visibility that we can offer them on the pages of quality news media sites is, is unrivaled to them. So they, they, they've been really uh, uh, excited about that problem. 
One more question, Alex, or? No? Fantastic. Let's give a huge okay. round for Samsa. Thank you. That was the first 10 companies. What's going to happen next? We're going to take a 15-minute break, so one, five, 15 minutes. And we're going to continue 30 past or half two, depending upon how you say that. So 1.30 PM is when we continue. See you in 15 minutes. Go. We're about to continue the Slush 100 semifinals for the last 10 companies. We're going to be pitching. Well, I'm not. They are going to be pitching for four minutes, followed by three minute Q and A's from our exceptional investors. Um, what's going to happen is they're going to come back to back to back. So it's going to feel really, really quick. But a four minute pitch should be long enough to get the message across of what they're building. First up. Every time I introduce a founder, I'm going to ask that you make as much noise as you can to make them feel really welcome to come on stage. They might feel a little bit hesitant, so make them feel welcome. Up first, we have Broaden. Callan, the co-founder and CEO, is going to share to you why their AI intelligence and task delivery platform um, for knowledge workers is the best solution in the world. Give a huge round of applause for Broaden. This is a story of how we ended up building an AI employee, Herbie. Back in July, we built a platform that allowed people to create their own chat GPT. Talk about being early. Our hypothesis was that business users will use it to create tools and automations. What we learned was that it was very difficult to build a GPT, and most importantly, it was the GPTs themselves didn't solve the problems of the user. The users had to continuously add more context into the platform. They had to copy and paste content. They had to feed in links. They had to prompt and reprompt the system. It was extremely frustrating. We then noticed one important behavior. Every time, the users wanted to improve the quality of the outputs. They went into the emails of the system and copied context from the email into our system. This context included important details like examples of previous work, references, guidelines, information that was part of the business context. The breakthrough moment came when we realized that for briefs with detailed requirements and a rich contextual data, our system was creating astonishing results. Data and context was everything. So we built a system that allows anybody to send an email to an agent the agent will read the instructions from the email, will negotiate a brief with the user, it will assimilate context for that brief, and execute it. End-to-end -end workflow. We didn't realize back then, but we were effectively building an AI employee. We called him Herbie. Herbie runs on a proprietary agent system that we've built from the ground up. For context, one email request could trigger a complex pipeline of up to 300 parallel tasks. Web scraping, web search, chains and prompts of chains are able to be triggered from one single request. Our agent goes deep on the data, extracts content for the information, accumulates this content, and comes back to the user with a well-rounded answer. It's like having an army of intelligent analysts at your disposal. Our first users are content marketers. Having good data is extremely important for content marketing, making it the perfect use case for Herbie. The content marketing market is set to grow from 2 billion to 20 billion in the next eight years. Adoption in enterprise is still lower than 38%. 
and jobs for content marketers are actually on the rise, showing that existing solutions do not work. But whilst our initial use cases were on content marketing, the users coming to us are already demanding different use cases. We've launched a month ago, and we've been doubling users every single week. We're at 500 users, and we've got 100 users from Slush using Herbie, our AI agent, to plan their days and activities here at Slush. My co-founder and I have incubated Nakoba, Nakoda together within Linklaters. We both have a background in AI and computer science. And the future will allow us to work side by side with AI employees. That future is inevitable. Join us in shaping it. Fantastic. Who's going to kick off the questions? Rafa. Thank you, Colin. Um, so how do you measure return on investment for your customers? So the most important thing for us in the content marketing use cases is to figure out the bank for buck on time spent in writing high quality content. So currently, to write a good blog post, it takes about eight hours, and you would outsource it or do it internally for 1,000 pounds. Within our system, the B2B clients that we currently have would do that within 20 minutes. So that's a return on investment. Thank you, Samsa, for sharing that story. Can you share a little bit of the team's background and why you landed on building in this space and what motivates you there? Of course. Both of us have background in AI and computer science. I've built an NLP product used by 5,500 companies and grew it from zero, zero to four, 4 million ARR. My co-founder, Victor, has a machine learning degree from University College London, has been training LLMs in 2018. OK, I'm going to ask a question, because we still have two minutes of questions worth to go. How challenging were the questions that they gave you? Were they exciting or hard? I was expecting more challenging. <laughs> OK. <laughs> can, you help, can you help us understand the reliability of a system today? and how you're measuring that? Yeah. So the challenge of the system and the challenge of building the system comes down to the complexity of the pipeline and the machinery that, that goes into the back end. Some of the challenges and the troubles that we're doing with now are coming from inherent limitations of LLM systems. So the predictability and the challenges within the systems are not within the deterministic workflow of the system, but are within the the spectrum of limitations of AI models. So to ensure that we are protected against safety blockages on models like public models like OpenAI and Claude, we're integrating with open source models so that we have more controls on what models we run for what workflows. What, what do you think the hardest technical challenge you have going forward is? The most important thing for us and to build a, a defensible business is for our agent to continuously accumulate business context. So our agent will do that from the conversations with the users and from external data that it scrapes. So that information and packaging that information in the knowledge graph is where we, we see the long-term defensibility of the business. Great questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Callan. Thank you. Next up, we have a company called Life Year. Seem is going to come on stage and share why their company is tackling the next, digi uh, sorry, the next <laughs> generation of digital healthcare, and they're trying to create a world without heart disease. Give a warm round of applause. Hello, my name is Seem. I'm the founder and CEO of Life Year. And I'm excited to share our vision of creating a world without heart disease. We're an accomplished team of doctors, scientists, engineers, and operators from Estonia and the UK. 
Uh, our company has grown out of a 1 million euro research and development project funded by the Estonian government to find novel ways of treating uh, cardiovascular disease. Today we are backed by some of the leading clinical and research organizations such as our shareholder, Oxford University Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust. The problem we're tackling is massive. Heart disease remains by far the most deadly and costly chronic disease on the planet. By different estimates, nearly one in three adults globally live with multiple cardiovascular risk conditions. That's a staggering 1.5 billion people on an accelerated path towards, towards their first heart attack or stroke. Think about it, that's nearly a third of the people in this room. What's even more striking is that we know 80% of these cardiac events could be prevented with earlier treatment. Yet our current healthcare systems are unable to meet this demand creating a widening cardiovascular care gap. Take James, for example, a 45-year-old father of two. Although his recent health audit clearly shows an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease, his family doctor has not provided a personalized treatment plan. So next time he goes to his doctor, his condition has gotten worse and he's now on a firm path to his first cardiac event. What if there was a better way to treat and monitor patients like James? Meet life here a new type of cardiovascular care platform that allows physicians to provide evidence-based treatment to a larger number of patients without increasing workload. It's a software as a medical device platform that combines multiple state-of-the-art technologies into digital first care pathways that have a measurable impact on the patient's cardiovascular health. These technologies include, for example, digital screening algorithm, remote patient monitoring, digital treatment programs, and AI-enabled patient engagement system. We focus on the four major cardiovascular risk conditions, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and the diabetes. And the treatment programs that we create can be used as standalone first-line therapy or combined with prescription medication. Our first commercial product, it's called Life Year Reset, targets obesity as a major cardiovascular risk condition. It combines GLP-1 medication with behavioral treatment and remote monitoring. Cardiovascular treatment market is a massive, massive global market, today dominated by the big pharma. But within it, we are seeing a fast-growing digital segment uh, that has 10x uh, the growth uh, speed than the total market. Uh, signaling a major digital transformation in the coming years. Life here intends to play a major role in this emerging market. Unlike single symptom competitors, we provide health systems a comprehensive care platform that governs all the major cardiovascular risk conditions on the same platform. Our target customers are private healthcare providers and payers in the EU, UK and US, but we are already also working with big pharma who are interested in adding a digital layer around their medical uh, treatments. Uh, our revenue model is based on monthly membership fee uh, and in addition annual license fee and value-based uh, contracts for uh, providers. We have a very clear go-to-market plan over the next two years, starting with a remote monitoring solution next year, and then following with clinically validated treatment programs like Lifeier Reset after that. We are Lifeier, and we invite you to join our mission of creating a world without heart disease. Thank you. Sim, thanks for building this business. It's very important. Um, Two-part question. Could you walk us through the strategy for patient acquisition through to retention? So, you know, patient activation, patient engagement, so on and so forth. And then can you help us understand today in the work that you've done where you think the medico economic outcomes are going to land? Sure. Um, so take James as an example, for example, um, to, to, to illustrate the patient pathway into the, into the service. So, for example, uh, when James goes to his family doctor, finds out he actually has several of cardiovascular risk factors elevated, um, the doctor prescribes or refers the patient to the system. The patient downloads the app and starts the autonomous program. So there is not a need for a care team intervention for most of the, uh, the program duration. Although we are building a system that escalates uh, patients who are not compliant to the treatment plan to the care team automatically. So that happens in the background. Um, 
the usual treatment program lasts for six months, during which the patient gets daily and weekly guidance from uh, the Life Here app, uh, in, on top of the medication as well. Uh, then after that, usually there's another visit with his family doctor or cardiologist, uh, for whom we provide a full report of what has happened during the six months. Uh, and uh, your question regarding the, uh, the, the cost benefit or the economic outcomes, uh, this is something that we are going to validate next year with Oxford University Hospitals and their health economic team. Uh, we're planning a major clinical feasibility trial. Thank you for sharing. Why do you think it's more beneficial to be a multi-system provider versus focusing on one specific symptom and really nailing it down? Thank you for the question. Um, in many ways, uh, we think of ourselves as sort of a vertically integrated um, platform, which means that we focus on cardiovascular disease, which is the biggest disease group, but it entails multiple different risk factors. So uh, the, the reason for that is that for most of these patients, they present with multiple of these conditions at the same time, not only one. Uh, and for most of these patients, this is a lifelong condition that they will need to manage for the rest of their lives. This helps us actually build a much better sort of lifetime journey for the patients. So while life here it might be a standalone product today, in future it will all be entrenched in one platform and I only need one prescription and one... Okay, thank you. Exactly, and all the data uh, is in the same place. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you for the questions. And thank you, Seem. Thank you. Next up, we've got a really interesting sector coming up on stage. And we have a company called Xworks Tech. And we're going to have their CEO co-founder, Electra, sharing you how they turn waste into wealth. Give a huge round of applause for Electra. Once upon a time, there was a $650 billion industry hiding in plain sight, the global waste trading industry. This is the story of Xworks Tech <clears throat> and how on a simple bootstrap MVP and a successful pivot this year, we're already generating $1.3 million ARR. My name is Electra. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Xworks, a collaborative enterprise software for the waste and recycling industry. My team and I have combined 26 years experience in waste management and commodities trading. We're backed by tech and finance with our mentor from Techstars. Let's focus on the problem. Today, there is no trusted space for the industry to trade and transact in. There are 200 million SMEs globally that engage in waste trading, relying on platforms like LinkedIn to network, and post, WhatsApp to trade millions of tons every year and to create communities. Plus, they need to be compliant. Meet Xworks, a revolutionary co collaborative software for the waste and recycling industry engineered around the communication norms. We facilitate transactions, we streamline and digitize, provide end-to-end -end tracking, and issue digital product passports. So, what makes us unique? It's our user-friendly approach. We understand our customers. And what we've done is we've crafted it around the way the, the industry actually communicates. We've taken inspiration from Slack and Discord. We've added in automated verifications, enhanced tracking using generative AI, and gamification. What does this do? This gives us control over the players, a comprehensive overview of the commodity flows, and an unparalleled user experience. We stand out in the ecosystem because we understand our customers. We're the only ones that have taken this approach. If it was obvious to everyone, it would already be done. Our deep industry knowledge gives us our tactical advantage. This is a $650 billion industry that's being mandated to adapt to a new digital era. Today, we have two main revenue sources, subscription 
and transactional based. But here's where the, it gets really exciting. This year, we've done a successful pivot and gone from zero to $1.3 million ARR all for facilitating the network in moving materials and helping them with logistics. To give you an idea, since we launched in November 22, we already have 1,100 subscribers. As we adapt, we adapt our model to capture the digital product passports. We are endorsed by the United Nations and several other notable endorsements. And we capture our clients naturally through the network's effect. We give them a safe space to trade and network and, and connect with each other. And our model means we do not have to spend any money on marketing. Our model is exponentially scalable, like the uptake of Slack and Discord. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here to push a solution. I'm here to address a significant problem our industry needs. And my industry and my team are the right people because of our deep industry knowledge. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll just kick off, Marco. Um, thank you for a great pitch. Um, I would love to understand the product a bit more. When you say white label solutions, what are they? Who are your customers there? Yeah. And, and then is the other part of a product basically like a B2B marketplace where you can kind of you know, invite your customers in your network, or if you just want to explain the, the, the two parts, that would yeah. be fantastic. So within the industry, there are uh, people called collectors, or companies called collectors. They're kind of the middleman between waste management and end users and recyclers. These guys are very, uh, very they, don't, they like to be secretive and they don't like to tell their prices. So what we found is that they've come to us and say, we want to use your network in order to sell our goods. And this is how we've done almost 5,000 tons of material. Uh, and on the other hand, we use the network's effect, so they, so customers invite other customers to come in and get verified. And we leverage off this, and this is why we haven't spent any money on marketing. Um, you mentioned the word accredited in, I think, your last slide, and you had a slide before that that showed several endorsements. Can you explain a bit more about what it takes to become accredited, what that means in your industry, and then what are these endorsements actually like? How yeah. is this relevant for the category you're building for? Why is that relevant? Yeah, so accredited means that we understand who the suppliers are, who the players in the middle are, so logistics, brokers, traders, recyclers, and then the end user. So we understand the full value chain, and this is where we can accredit the movement of material specifically. And we accredit the players, meaning the companies that are joining the network, and we certify them to make sure they have the right licenses to operate. Here in, the, here in Europe, you have to have an environmental license, and that's why we're starting here. And sorry, the second question? Just um, the, 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 the organizations that you had as uh, Oh, and uh, endorsements. the endorsements, yeah. yeah what, so who they the, are and what they mean exactly. The United Nations, I'll give you an example. They've, uh, they've uh, given us their endorsement on their website. So if you go to the sustainability pledge, you find XWorks up there. And what that means is they love the, ca the data that we're capturing and what we're able to do with that data. So everything in XWorks is meticulously tracked. And then we're able to analyze that data. And that's what they like. What, what type of data are you actually collecting around the materials themselves? Around the materials. So we, have, we can go very granular, but right now on our bootstrapped MVP, we're able to understand um, quality, pictures, location, contamination levels. We understand um, subcategories of the materials. We can get quite granular, but then we have now enough data that we can start um, uh, um, our AI model to start looking high level to understand the difference between metals and paper, et cetera. And then it can start getting quite granular. Could you, could you just double click on the quality piece if you have a minute, just walk us through that? So the quality piece, when they upload uh, the, the commodities on there, they'll put pictures. And then we'll ask them, what is it? They'll say it's plastics. And then they'll, we'll say, what kind of plastics are there? Uh, they'll say it's uh, PET. Then we'll say, OK, is there any sub-level under that? And they'll say, yes, it's 95.5, for example. Then they'll tell us if there's any contamination. They'll tell us how many tons there are available. And they'll also tell us um, what, how many load weights 
can go in a truck or container, uh, and any further comments. So we'll capture pictures and, uh, and sort of data that we can now start analyzing. Whew. Tough questions from the judges. Thank you, Electra. Thank Huge you. Round of applause. <laughs> Next up, we have a startup from the UK called Factored. David Reby, who is the co-founder of Factored, is going to come and share why they are leading the charge in revolutionizing landlord finance with a strong emphasis on sustainability. Please welcome David. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Energy inefficient rental properties are bad for landlords, tenants, and the planet. And the biggest barrier to solving this is cost. Energy inefficient rental properties are bad. Oops, sorry. In fact, 40% of carbon emissions come from real estate. And as 80% of the buildings that will exist, exist in 2050 are built already, retrofitting is crucial to cut CO2. Investment in building decarbonization needed to hit net zero 2050. We empower landlords to tap into future rental income, to cut carbon emissions and improve tenant well-being. Our platform allows landlords to take up to £15,000. This can be paid back to more manageable monthly payments usually between 12 to 18 months. We've developed a super fast underwriting and decisioning system. And in our platform, we use facial recognition and biometric AI. This is because security is something that we take very, very seriously. So why would a landlord sell their rent to us as opposed to traditional financing? We are super fast, usually providing a 48-hour guarantee. We're far more inclusive. We have far less credit drawbacks, no early repayment fees, no hard credit checks, and reward green practices. We are in a climate emergency. Costs are high, especially when it comes to retrofitting. And the rental market is booming, so there's lots of rental income to buy. We as co-founders understand landlords, because we are landlords ourselves. Ben has a decade of finance experience, including being a founding team member of a platform that serves 10,000 monthly users. And I have a startup acquisition and IPO under my belt, both in prop tech slash AI. Plus, Ben and I have known each other for 25 years. And if we could survive school looking like this, we can survive the challenges that will come with Factored to make it a global success. We don't have any major direct competitions, but there are loads of lending billion-dollar startups out there. We will remain competitive using our proprietary underwriting by signing hundreds of partners to create a sustainable marketplace and build a brand landlords love. We've gone for a partner-first go-to-market strategy, focusing on landlords and sustainability. Our target market are UK landlords who earn between 15,000 and 200,000 pounds annually and have between one to 10 properties. So what have we done so far? We're post revenue with $80,000 ARR. We have strategic VC and angel funding. We have secured debt financing for over 10 million pounds. 
and have over 10 partners that we work with. Thank you very much. Amazing. Let's hop straight into the questions. Thank you, David. Um, how do you enforce the sustainability angle in the platform? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So at this stage, we uh, ask our landlords what they're going to use their money for. And we, we ask for evidence for that. In the future, we plan to reward them uh, for carbon reducing activities. Can you share a bit more about your underwriting mechanism besides the facial recognition? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of underwriting, uh, we do a credit check. Um, we check that the landlord owns the property. Um, we currently speak to them. We check the addresses. We check the company. We do open banking. Um, there's like a 20-step process of which we do. It takes around 35 minutes. Um, it's something that we think we can reduce to around 30 seconds with AI. Um, but right now, we're only two months in, so we're not there yet. Thank you. Do you want to walk us through, like, who's your typical landlord? How much do they usually borrow? What are kind of the usual terms? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so a typical landlord tend to have multiple properties at the moment, uh, between one to 10. They turn to earn between 15,000 and 200,000 pounds annually in rental income. And they, they tend to want to use it for refurbishment or retrofitting, but predominantly retrofitting. Any more questions? Judges, Luke. Um, do maybe the like, sources of liquidity, are, are you providing the loans or are you connecting them to lenders who are taking on that risk? How does yeah, that part it's of the a good question. Work? So we're, we're not a loans company. Um, what we do is we buy the future rental income, um, which has a number of benefits to the landlords. The way we take, um, we have a debt provider currently, uh, which we distribute to um, the landlord. Um, the debt provider has equity in the business today. Great. Any other questions? No? Thumbs up from the judges. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much. Backstage. Awesome. We're going to keep on going. We're on a treadmill now. We're going to keep running as we go. Next up, we have an exciting company called Fercado. Evolena, the co-founder of the company, is going to come on stage and share to you how they make secondhand the most obvious choice and the easy choice for every single consumer. Give a huge round for Evelena. Hi, Helsinki. My name is Evelena, and I entered politics at 12 because I believed in our society's capacity to do better. Better than the 9,000 smartphones and truckloads full of clothes emptied every second on landfills around the globe better than the three planets we'll need by 2050 if we continue to consume as much. And that's why I've always bought most of my stuff secondhand. It's my secret to save money and CO2. A secret that I actually share with most younger consumers, and that is why the resale market is booming, currently worth 200 billion euros in Europe and growing 11 times faster than retail. And yet, Those of you who have ever tried finding something specific secondhand know that because the market is growing so fast, it is fragmented and messy, making the experience time consuming, inconvenient and unsexy. So when I read that 75% of millennials and Gen Z would buy more secondhand if only it were simpler, I knew that there was a big opportunity to do better. As a climate activist who spent years building and growing successful tech businesses, I know two things to be true. One, there is no future without a circular economy. If you believe and agree to the fact that the earth is not flat, then you'll also agree with the fact that a linear economy on a circular planet cannot work. And two, if I wanted to make re-commerce the new e-commerce, I would need the best partners. And so I called my friend Ali, a software engineer whom I met at a YC back scale up. He was the co-founder of one of the first Amazon for books in Iran. And our friend Oli 
a born entrepreneur who had a first exit at 18 with a second-hand marketplace. And together, we're building Fercado to help people buy better. Fercado is the first AI-powered sustainable shopping assistant, helping every consumer buy better with a browser plugin that automatically finds the best second-hand alternatives to what users are looking for. It uses machine learning to match the text and images and automatically um, take the user from the website where they are into the second-hand alternative. And that is why the second-hand platforms love us. We are the acquisition and retention channel of their dreams. We have already onboarded seven, uh, 55, uh, 55 platforms like eBay, Vestiaire Collective, and Back Market, and uh, integrated 40 million products, electronics, books, and fashion. And our users love it too. That is why we have currently 100K in GMV. They also like the fact that for them, Fercado is free. It's our partners who pay us for the leads and sales we help them generate. As our plan is to turn e-commerce into re-commerce, the browser plugin is just the first step. The future is Fercado will be in every pocket of every consumer, empowering them to save time, money, and CO2 by making secondhand their first choice. Now, I'd like you to close your eyes, because in a few years, when we've successfully turned a trillion dollars e-commerce market into re-commerce, you'll think back at this moment and tell your friends that you were on the right side of history. So make sure to remember that name, Fercado. Thank you. Luke has the mic and he's ready to go. Um, how much of the inventory is online today versus existing in, you know, it's like a, a, a vintage shop or something that might be where you wouldn't find that inventory online. You have to go to the, like the physical place and then browse. Yeah. So currently, most of the market is moving online. There is a small portion that stays offline. But really what you see is that the huge players like eBay, Vestia Collective, Back Market, uh, represent 80% of the market at the moment. OK, but, but I've, just to clarify, 80% uh, of, of that inventory is already online today? Yes. Ah, OK, yes. great. And then, you can, and then run your algorithms over these exactly. databases, or are you web scraping? Like, how are you finding and then doing we, the matchmaking? So basically, we have, those, we have partnerships with all of those players that really cover most of European market at the moment. And we have an API integration, so we don't even need to scrape. We actually have partnerships with them. Could you tell us a little bit more about those partnerships, how they work, and what the model is of for course. some of these players? Yeah. OK. Um, so we have different types of partnerships. Uh, there's a very scalable way of doing it, which is going through affiliate platforms and then applying, and then everything is automated. We also have a lot of one-on-one -on -one partnerships where we have individual deals and like really proper um, deals that we negotiate with them. Um, and on the long run, the goal is really to turn all of the partnerships into like really um, individual one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations and agreements. Could you walk us a bit through your mobile strategy? Yes. So obviously, um, a, long, a lot of younger consumers shop on their phone, and we are aware of that. And this is not something that we are ignoring. We decided to go for the browser extension first because we really saw that there is an enormous untapped market there also to help people change their behaviors um, or help, help consumers really um, adopt new behaviors that they're already mostly um, uh, really okay with. Um, so when you see Honey, for instance, the browser plugin that finds you the coupon, they have currently 20 million users, and they were bought by PayPal for 4.5 billion, and they mostly a browser uh, extension. So we saw, OK, there is a huge market there. Now, the Fercado will soon be in an app as well, and we are working to find a way to also make this magic pop-up appear also on, uh, on mobile. So it's 
ongoing. I think it will be live in a few weeks. So. Thank you. We all agree that the Earth is not flat. So um, climate right. is an important topic, right? <laughs> so linear uh, against linear economy and yeah. for circular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess what I'd love to understand a bit better is uh, you mostly make money through affiliate marketing and basically kickbacks from the partners that you work with, right? Can you help us understand what would be a revenue scale that a vintage a eBay would be paying for you? Yeah. So. Currently, we have a hybrid model. Um, it's affiliate partnerships where we get between 3 and 10% of the sale. And it's also leads where we get between 20 cents and 1 euro per click. Um, in the future, we have a few other options as well. And we want to try and move towards more the lead part because it's actually we're then not uh, responsible for how good the partner can go to um, convert the person into a sale. Um, and in terms of the actual scale, we're talking 25 euros per revenue per user per year. OK. Well, thank you for the questions. Thank you, Fercado. Thanks. <laughs> The love that you're giving now, please keep that up. The founders love it backstage as well. Next up, we have a company called Monad. And Jessica, the co-founder, yes, I love the scream in this crowd. Um, Monad is a home bill management software company empowering everybody to, to manage your subscriptions and your bills. That sounds fantastic, right? Give a huge round for Monad. Moi, my name is Jessica. My name is Jessica, and I'm the founder of Monad. And I have lived in many different places. And the most frustrating thing is that over the last five years, the subscription economy has grown by 500%. So it is nearly impossible for me to keep track of all of the bills and services I have, particularly when I've been in different places. The problem is not just felt by people like me. It is that 78% of renters, they don't really know how many bills they're subscribing to. This amounts to stress, time, and money. And when you're frustrated enough, you start hiring a virtual assistant to help you in setting up some of the bills or asking your property manager to do so as well. But this is just hiring illiquid people to be able to do something that is handling personal information and sensitive data. And these may just pass the errors along the communication chain. So even if you just wanted to communicate with an insurance company or your utility company or your gym membership, you're just going to end up being frustrated all over again. This is why we have built the first AI-powered home bill management system that is allowing people to do three things. And the fourth one is a great perk. So one is providing complete bill awareness. So we're quite unique in that we're not allowing anyone to just link their bank accounts. Just with inputting your email address and your address information, we're able to discover all of the bills and services because we're contextualizing invoice data and providing it in a way that makes sense. Then we want them to take action. So be able to update, pause, and cancel all of the services whenever they need to. Be able to know what's coming ahead so they can be proactive instead of reactive and get like those hefty fees. And we also are building a recommendation engine in the background that is allowing them to see which services are available in particular areas. The fourth one is the most important one. And this is the reason why we're able to work with banking networks. That means that we are 100% compliant. We are building in compliance with ISO 2700. We undergo security audits. And starting next year, because of this, we're going to allow people to link not just one, but multiple bank accounts. And they are going to be able to associate multiple addresses in our platform. We're working with top global residential companies that are introducing us into the market. So these are property manager companies and relocation companies that are licensing their solution and providing it to their renters or passing on the fees to their renters themselves. And this is how exactly how we've been able to grow. These lights are already outdated. This year alone, we have five extra revenue. We have grown 20% month over month. We have zero marketing spend, and we have three-year contracts. 
the millennial generation and the Jesse generation are the ones that we're targeting, particularly the rental market. So it's mostly people like me and younger who like to have a flexible living lifestyle and they don't like inflation. So really want to be responsible and be on top of it. We don't have any direct competitors. At the moment, some of the competition might be focusing on budgeting or utility setup. We are the only one that is really redefining and building the future of living and in that creating a new category. We have exited engineers and they are far more experienced than I am. So we have Ali, our main engineer, has exited a business and sold it to Wealth Simple, a fintech. And then Ricardo has built NLP algorithms and he's creating our AI engine, our orchestration engine as well. And he was in a company acquired by SAP. And I have been able to launch products globally that have generated $1.5 million in revenue right after launch. This year has been a great year for us. We already were in NASDAQ and we're looking for the right partners to get us there again and be able to reach 10 million households over the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Judges. Um, thank you for a great pitch. Mm -hmm. I wondered, uh, do you want to kind of elaborate on your positioning a bit? Because if you're positioning this as like a cost-cutting behavior type of thing, you're still charging your customers for access to the platform. How does that square with like the average actual savings that your customers would have? And how would you move from being perceived as like a very much a nice to have kind of retention tool to something that's really making a dent in customers? Uh, so I think like uh, your question is twofold. One is we have a premium product available. So anybody can sign up to our platform and go to mona.io right now. You'll be able to find your services associated to your home in less than 60 seconds. And that is one option that we have. If you want to link your bank accounts, that is a premium solution because we are actually operating with different banking providers in order to do so. So there's a difference. And about the cost cutting, a lot of the focus on other companies have been on cost cutting. We are centralizing everything on their home bill management and that is like having complete bill awareness. So that means that you don't necessarily need to be, you know, have the cost cutting, but you need to be aware in order to make the right decisions to execute cost cutting or renewals or cancel a, uh, a subscription altogether. So that is the incentive that we have. It's like be aware so you can be pro proactive of all of the things that you have associated to you instead of just being like, oh, I want to do a savings. We are the one place that is associated, unlike other companies, um, that is anchoring in the home. So the incentive, the economic behavior that they have is already there in associating to the home. And we are managing all the recurring payments that they have and allowing them to be, to be attuned as to what's coming ahead so they can actually take action. Thank you for sharing. We all know that subscription and memberships can creep up in your bank account and you never know what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. But isn't this more of a one-time thing? So for once I optimize it and then I'm a good for a year or maybe two? No. Because you don't really know, like the subscription economy has gone by 500%. You're going to be accumulating more subscriptions and services as you go along. Like you may just right now over here, you may sign up to like a magazine subscription or something that just creeps up into your bill. So we are allowing people to understand what is new, what is old, what are the price shifts available that are out there, and what is the seasonality of everything so they can be attuned to like when things are expiring or things are just continuing through the process. It is allowing them to have more proactivity in terms of what they have. And just an extension to that question, mm -hmm. I think on one of the slides where you showed your ARR, yeah. um, you, you, I think it said that you have three year contract lengths. So yeah. as a consumer, am I signing up for three years in advance? No, so yeah, so property management companies are actually licensing our technology and providing it for free to the renters. So that means that they are paying. So like all of the contracts that we currently have are with residential businesses who are covering the cost for the renters. So in that case, the renter doesn't have to pay anything. They're just getting us a perk for free. These type of companies are more in the premium, flexible living space like a Sunder. We do business with Blue Ground and they're all over the world and they are bringing us the volume for our system. Got it, okay, I missed that in the, in the yeah. that's a good clarification. And then what percent of the business then, like I think you said 50,000 in ARR today, what yeah. percent of that is from a property manager versus consumers that are buying 
individually? So the majority, so I would say like 80% of all of our transactions at the moment have come from the property manager and the B2B2C. Why? They want to remove themselves from liability. They want to provide a value add, stick in a service for the residents. And they want to differentiate themselves instead of having somebody else, you know, do something like it. So that is how we're growing. Fantastic. Thank you for the questions. And thank, thank you, you. Monad. <laughs> yes, let's keep that. Whoever is screaming, I love it. Let's keep that going. Uh, next up, we have BoxBox. You're going to have the co-founder, Marcus, uh, hop on stage, and he's going to share why they are building the Airbnb of storage. Give a huge round of applause once again. Hello there. My name is Marcus, and I'm here to talk more about BoxBox. What is BoxBox? BoxBox is like an Airbnb, but for storage. And yes, it is as easy as it sounds. You go down to your basement or garage, take five pictures, and upload them to boxbox.com and start making money. But what's the problem with storage nowadays? Nowadays, storage is really expensive. It's inconvenient locations, and we're not efficiently using all of the space out there. How are we solving it? Really easy stuff with a really easy marketplace. So we connect people with properties, to these people who need space. So, and our users make money thanks to that. Why now? Demand is at all time high. Self-storage occupancy in European Union is roughly around 90%. So that means that we're almost at the capacity. And 39% of the people living in the EU have had paying difficulties paying the bills. What about our market? Market size is roughly around 120 billion if you include parking itself. And the market itself is validated because we already have roughly around 48 million customers using self-storage nowadays. A picture tells you more than a thousand words. As you can see, the box box is at the top and we do everything better than everybody else. So we're fully automated. We have a property management system, application, logistics, insurance, you name it. We just do everything better than everybody else. Here is a little bit more in detail. We build less and we travel less by decentralizing the whole storage space itself. Advantage two is that we're fully automizing everything thanks to our partners like iLock, Omacom, Verif, etc making storage so much easier. And of course, at the same time, we're giving every single people an actual source of a real passive income. And here's some more pictures about how intuitive and how easy it is to use our application. What's our business model? We're a two-sided marketplace, and our transaction fee is roughly around 15%. And of course, we have additional revenues like iLock, as I mentioned before. Here's our team. They're just more better than, than I am, so to speak, and thanks to them, it is possible to make BoxBox happen. I have two amazing co-founders called Kevin and Maria. Maria, she is the reason why we're here, and she pushed, that, pushed us this far, and Kevin is responsible for the expansion itself. Thanks to him, we have roughly around 20,000 square meters available for rent out. Then we have tech team, Max and Bogdan. They work wonders. They won hackathons, uh, TechCrunch, you name it, uh, they're always at the top one. And then we have Carolina as well. She's responsible for our marketing, and thanks to her, everybody in Estonia knows what BoxBox Box is. Here we have some pre-seed investors called Kalle, and uh, he was part of Next Games that was sold later to Netflix. And Pietre as well, he was in Supercell. Here's our revenue, uh, some of the plans, how we do it. Right now, we're gonna close this year with roughly around 100,000 euros this year. And we're looking to raise one mil to expand towards Scandinavia. Cheers. Thanks. Can, can you talk a little bit about the security? Um, so yes. if I use a self-storage facility, I mean, I know that it's a locked facility, it's in a secure location, et cetera. If I'm gonna store my things in someone's garage, for example, 
I don't know if they're going to leave the garage door open. Like, how do you ensure or do you provide uh, insurance on, on things that are stored in people's locations? Is that on the host that's providing that? Maybe talk a bit about that. Sure thing, yeah. User actually pays for the insurance. So it's up to the user how secure they want to position everything. And at the same time, as I mentioned before, we have iLock. So that means it's automated, smart lock. That means it doesn't require any batteries, any internet connection. We can make sure when the customer comes in, and if the door is open, if the door isn't open, we can make sure absolutely everything is taken care of in regards to it. And if you mentioned insurance as well, we have Omocom, a Swedish company, that makes everything really, really easy. How are you thinking about like hacking the market to not get killed on kind of customer acquisition costs as well as kind of space renter acquisition costs over time? Sure thing, yeah. Uh, right now here in Estonia, what we have kind of done is uh, affiliate marketing, and that works wonders for us. So for example, we have a lot of influencers who are just interested in the project itself, and they love to just get a percentage out of the customers that they're acquiring towards BoxBox itself. And thanks to this kind of model, it has been able, and it has been really easy to scale, at least in Estonia. We have to figure out what's possible in Sweden and Norway and Denmark, and that's our plans in the future. You shared a, a few numbers on revenue and on and traction. Can you share a little bit more on that and how many storage unit is that? How many customers? Sure. As I mentioned before, 20,000 square meters, thanks to Kevin, we have acquired. And uh, we have roughly around 450 transactions up to date. And this year, we're going to close just at under 100,000 euros of revenue. Keep the questions coming. One, t one more. <laughs> and then uh, what's your gross margin on? So 100,000 in revenue today. How does that flow on a margin basis? It's roughly around 50% from, uh, from the user itself. 5% uh, comes from the host, 10% from the actual person who needs storage. And um, yeah, we have additional revenue streams as well, as I mentioned before. Storage is one of them as a transaction fee. Then we have the uh, transportation and then the insurance on top of it. Fantastic. Thank you for the questions, and thank you, BoxBox. Cheers. Take care. We are now down to the final, oh, sorry, not the final, I'm not going to say that word, to the last three companies, and they're going to be pitching on the stage. Next up, we have Color Tones. And Henrik, the co-founder, is going to come on stage, and he's going to share how they want the future, the, how they want to shape the future of digital music education. Give a huge round of applause for them. Hey. God. Thank you, Chef Mandat. That's me. Wow. Wow, Helsinki. Wow. I would love to play like Jerry Lee. I'm actually a quite okay piano player, and I thought I want to learn this song. So what were my options? Traditional sheet music is one route, but I also stumbled this incredibly popular piano type used on YouTube. And nowadays, millions learn like this. And we at Color Tones are advancing piano type videos. Bear with me, you will see. Guys, last month I wrote a beautiful song. I'm not sure if you want to play my song, but that's my mom. And I'm sure she would love to play the song. But how can we teach my mom my song if she doesn't know how to read sheet music? And that's where Color Tone steps in. We film musical instruments and use augmented reality to revolutionize digital music education. Let me introduce to you our learning recording sharing framework. Our concept of learning and our working MVP looks like this. Piano type videos, but with your own keyboards and hands. On the screen, Users can see numbers indicating which finger to use, and the video only proceeds if you hit the correct key with the correct finger. This is the song I wrote for my mom to play. And instead of writing down sheet music for hours, I filmed it in seconds. And augmented reality generates an awesome piano type video for her. And if you want, you can share the song. And this way, it's not just us, but our entire community contributing to the rich database of easy-to-follow tutorials. It works for the piano, but not only that. Color tones can already apply to ukulele and guitar. Our vision is to harness augmented reality to most instruments, like the guitar, the drums, or the chimes. Some instruments can be filmed from the front, 
like string instruments, just open the laptop and you're ready. But others, like the piano or uh, the chimes, need to be filmed from above. That's why we use this, a simple lens mirror clip you can put on the front camera of your device. Our business model is a free Mozart's business model. Basic access and content creation will be free, and for 10 years a month, people can unlock unlimited music lessons. We tested color tones with hundreds, and were overwhelmed by the positive feedback. Children, uh, adults, and even grandmas love the new way how to play the piano. And uh, the, market, the market we are entering is the global online music education market, which is valued at 330 million euros, with an annual growth rate of 18%. However, since we are also advancing private lessons, we are actually addressing the much larger market of global private music education valued at uh, 26 billion euros. So what sets us apart in the vast landscape of great music learning apps? And that's the use of sound and sight. Using both camera and microphone, we provide an interactive learning environment, all powered by smart computer vision algorithms that can perfectly detect your hands and instruments. And who's behind color tones? Sebastian uh, is a business chemist and our mastermind for business affairs, with great experience in the industry. And I'm Hendrik. I finished my master in nuclear physics with 22, and I developed the AI for particle accelerator. And we're both music teachers. Our vision is to bring augmented reality to music education for everybody. And if you share that vision, come join us. We start a pre-seed round in early 2024. So let's call it planet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Wow, you brought the whole team with you. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Netherlands, the Dutch people, and don't. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you for that as well. Thank you. Judges. All right, Henrik. Um, so having a bit of a hardware, I mean, I imagine it's not a hardware, but your gadget thing yeah. that you put on the phone can be a bit of a, a bottleneck for growth. How, how are you thinking about you know, mitigating that for? You're right. Um, so the piano needs to be filmed from above. It's like there, there's some solution. You can also do it yourself if you have a second phone and you can put it over the piano somehow. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a very cheap device. It will cost uh, 10 euros or 20. Um, so uh, and, yeah, yeah, it can be. But uh, if you really want to learn the piano and you're engaged in learning it, and uh, uh, a monthly album moment costs anyway, and, and the competitor's 20 euros, it's the price is okay. Thank you for the energizing presentation. <laughs> it's <Thank> really good. <laughs> um, how do you, where do you currently stand in terms of go-to-market? What are your acquisition channels? How are you yeah. thinking about this? I know it's early, but it's more about your framework. Yeah, um, so in the last month, we were developing as fast as we can that we can test a new product. And what we want to do now is that we bring everything to the iPads and phones. And so our next steps is bringing, like, uh, developing every, everything for your hardware at home. And then we want to sell it in a, in a great way uh, so that everybody can create those music content just with a smartphone camera and, and flood the, the, uh, the internet with it. Oh. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what are you personally most excited about in the coming year? Like, what do you want to achieve? What's the main milestone? Let me tell you a story. Like, uh, like when we tested the product, there was a grandma and she played Happy Birthday for her husband and she never touched the piano. And those moments when I see people playing an instrument and they don't have an idea before is what makes me so happy and it's the reason why I'm here. Uh, so I'm excited about seeing that. Um, la last question. Um, maybe, well, actually, I don't know if you have one too, but um, so there are products on the market today that will show you, like if you have an iPad, it'll, yeah. sh it'll highlight like the key for you and it'll, with color, yeah. similar to what we saw on the screen. Is the differentiation that you can take any so like a, a sound file and then generate that that view, or it wasn't clear to me exactly so, what's different versus other products in the market right now. So what's different is that you ski on the screen your own piano, so your own hands. So using the camera uh, like makes you able to guide you visually on your own keyboard and on your own guitar. But not only that, like we can also better understand like the thing, like the hands movement and the finger finger style and stuff, and you're able to share all your content in a video-based format, what everyone does now on TikTok. Got it. Okay. But, but, but uh, let's say like you create a song and you, I want to learn that song. 
do I need to then like the the notes and everything for that? H how do you generate that part of the product? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So like if that doesn't exist yet today, do, yeah. do you automatically produce that in yes. in the app? Yes. Okay. Got it. Thanks. What is the model with the creators today? And and can you just what is the model with the creators? And can you help us understand the, the content strategy a little better? Uh, how you get the content? Yeah. Like yeah. Who's who's creating the content? How do you work with them? Why, why yeah. do they want to be on your platform versus produce something great. and distribute yeah. it via YouTube? Yeah, great question. So uh, I'm, I'm myself, I'm a music teacher, and I want to teach my students sometimes the songs. And what I give them now is a sheet of paper with the notes, and I need put some notes there. And my students, they need to write letters next to the notes. But I want them to directly understand what I played. So what I can do now is that I film my instrument, and on the instrument there are like computer vi like visual effects that guide you and tell you where I pressed on my instrument that others directly can play is as notes. So it can be a faster version of creating notes. Amazing. Thank you for the questions, and thank you, yeah. Color Tone. Thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> can I ask that we just do that for the last two as well? Because that's great energy, and I love it. Is that OK? Cool. Last two companies before the judges get rushed into a secret room and decide the top three. Next up, we have Equi, and Catherine, the founder, uh, co-founder and CEO, is going to share why they, um, why they are the only virtual health companion empowering women with personal insights and seamless patient-doctor communication. Give a huge round and some of that noise. I'm Catherine, co-founder and CEO of Equi. We're the only virtual health companion empowering women with personal insights and seamless patient-doctor communication. I've been one of the 50% of women whose health concerns are dismissed. I visited numerous specialists, yet each appointment left me with more questions than answers. Did I explain my symptoms correctly? Why was it so hard for them to understand and find solutions? During a sabbatical in Valencia last year, I felt compelled to find answers to these questions. And hundreds of research papers, interviews, and stories later, I discovered that it's not just me. Millions of women across the world are left undiagnosed for years because they struggle to understand and communicate their symptoms. Meanwhile, providers tell us that they spend 90% of their time trying to interpret symptoms. There is a fundamental communication gap in women's healthcare. So why does this happen? Underneath the surface, women lack the tools to advocate for themselves. And women and providers have no common language to talk about symptoms. This insight gave birth to ECVI. Our mission is to bridge this communication gap, starting with endometriosis, a chronic condition with no cure that affects 10% of women globally. They often wait eight to 10 years to get diagnosed, experience excruciating pain, infertility and depression. It's like bursting your appendix every month and waiting a decade for relief. And this is just the first of many women's health concerns ECVI will tackle. ECVI was created to empower women and providers with insights and seamless communication. We meet women wherever they are on their journey. The first part of our end-to-end -end solution is our app, which is currently in a closed beta. We've done extensive research to map what providers need to know to diagnose a patient. We have transformed those diagnostic guidelines into an intuitive tracker for women. Through our proprietary technology, we analyze this data to help women understand their symptoms. And when women are at the doctor's office, they can turn on doctor mode to share their symptoms in medical lingo. In addition, we provide evidence-based information and a supportive community. So all this track data is transformed into one universal language, shortening women's time to diagnosis and saving providers time taking medical history. Our platform is easily scalable to other conditions and verticals globally, saving time and resources across healthcare systems and society at large. We're a diverse team combining expertise in product, tech, design and healthcare. My co-founder, Mabin, is an experienced tech entrepreneur who's built SaaS platforms and apps for 17 plus years. And we serve the world's biggest and most attractive market, women. 
It's half the population and both the femtech and telehealth markets are growing rapidly. Equia offers a freemium model, a paid subscription, and in-app purchases. In B2B, we provide a robust data platform of easy follow-up of patients. And our community connects ECV users to a diverse range of providers. And this dual model allows us to capitalize on network effects, setting us apart from the competition. In addition, we're building a uniquely insightful data set that has multiple use cases, both commercial and systemic. We're building critical mass in B2C through endometriosis associations, influencers, and our in-app community. In B2B, we've already secured a pilot with a women's health clinic, and the founder even invested in us. Post-launch, we'll use cross-channel strategies to onboard more users, boost engagement, and partner with three more clinics within the first nine months. We are currently fundraising, and I would love to tell you more. So let's start the conversation and close the communication gap in women's health together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ekvi. Judges. Catherine, thanks for building this business. Thank uh, you. you. know, chronic disease in women is a massively underserved area, and yeah. frankly, we just need to do better as a society. Um, can you share some of the early learnings from the beta today? What are you learning about these women? Why are they coming? You know, what is your actual potential impact on the diagnosis and, and, and treatment outcomes? Yeah, so a lot of the women who come to us either have the diagnosis endometriosis or they suspect that they have it. And the key value of our product is their ability to track historic symptoms, to be able to see patterns and also present that data to their healthcare providers. I um, can only echo what Alex says. Thank you for building this. What do you think is going to be the key thing for you guys to nail to actually kind of, to not just disappear in the plethora of kind of fertility tracking, cycle tracking apps out there? What do you feel that kind of the insights that you have could actually like move the needle for real? I think it, the key is the dual model that we actually connect women with the right providers. So for endometriosis, for example, they often need uh, a diverse set of providers to manage their condition. Uh, so we can connect women who have certain symptoms with the provider who will actually be able to help them with those symptoms. And, and why do you think you'll be able to cut through the noise with the providers? So why providers would want to yeah, work with yeah. us? What will make them excited and enthusiastic and push you guys? because they also need the data, because they don't know. They have very little time, like maybe 10 to 15 minutes for each appointment. And being able to view just a dashboard of what happened with your patient from the last appointment is really valuable. Can you share a bit on uh, how you want to address on the one side the B2C angle directly to patient and then the other side to the provider? How do you address them and go to market? So right now we have a pilot in uh, in a women's health clinic where we're you know figuring out the clinical or the in clinical setting. Uh, in B two C is going to be a lot community driven. Uh, that's our approach. So I got time for one more. Can you just help us understand the physician acquisition like you know motion like you know are you going after specific specialists or are you going after GPs? Help us understand how you're actually you know, finding these people and, and onboarding their patients. So right now, we're talking to a diverse set of providers. So it's uh, you know, a physiotherapist, sexologist, gynecologist, everyone who treats women with endometriosis. And we've had really positive feedback from basically everyone we've talked to who want to test uh, and help us develop the product. So uh, yeah, it's going to be first private clinics, but also privately practicing providers. Well, wow. thank you for the questions, and thank you, Ekvi. Thank you, guys. All right, we're now on our last one before the judges get rushed off and decide who are going to be the top three. So for the last one, Manasseh, you make a lot of noise when they hop on stage. The company's name is Sovin, and Selena, the co-founder and CEO, is going to come share about their pioneering health consumer startup that's tracking, sorry, tackling chronic sleep disruption with their innovative earbud solution. Give a huge round for the last company. Okay. 
So in Dutch, we say slap lekker before going to bed, which means sleep delicious. Sleep is anything but delicious for me because you see, for years I struggle with teeth grinding and jaw clenching in my sleep. I fractured two molars, woke up so many mornings with jaw pain and headaches, feeling so hungover even though I just had eight hours of sleep. How many of you empathize with this? I can see hands going up, yeah, because statistics says up to 30% of adults are affected. For something that affects so many people, we have so few options. There is mouth guard that you could wear every night, or get Botox to paralyze your jaw muscles every three months. And get this, neither actually address the root cause, because teeth grinding and clenching is actually linked to sleep disruption. It's our body's attempt to stabilize our sleep when there's disrupted, and over time, it just becomes an overlearned behavior, a habit. Now, I happen to develop medical devices for a living. So naturally, I thought upon learning all of this, why can't we develop a solution that actually targets the sleep disruption itself? Can't be that hard, right? What a stereotypical startup founder response. Well, my co-founder and I tried so many different approaches. We tried all the existing wearables, existing sensors, smart bedding, smart speakers, smart pillows. Problem is, none of them could detect sleep disruption accurately. They couldn't intervene in real time while still being comfortable. We almost gave up until one day we discovered that the ear is the perfect place to address this issue. Let me tell you why. Because from the ear, you can detect jaw muscles, jaw movement, respiration, heart rate, all the data points that the algorithm needs to detect. And through the ear, we can actually also intervene in real time using soft acoustic waves as a way to guide you back to restful sleep. And that's not all. Using the data from the device, we can also serve up personalized insights as to what really tend to increase your sleep disruption. Because it could be caffeine, it could be your sleep position, it could be alcohol, so many things. Solvin is the reality, thanks to our team. We are an international team, domain experts in AI machine learning, sleep science, DTC marketing, all the key areas that we need to succeed. But what makes us formidable, if you ask me, is that each of us has a personal connection to the problem, and we're so motivated to finally create a lasting solution for ourselves as well as for others. In a short period of time, we created a prototype that proved the concept that convinced partners to join us. Off note, we convinced an earbud manufacturer to join forces with us. We cut development time by three years, and we refined the design seven times to bring you this, the world's smallest, most comfortable sleep solution. So we're launching in 2024 in this market, four billion market, where we already have pre-sales as well, as well as thousands of people on the wait list. We are going direct as a way to gain traction, get direct feedback from customers, and iterate faster. Although, in order to scale, we will be using channel partners. So I'm just going to close with this. This earbuds that we have has multiple application. It could be used for, um, so the hardware as well as the machine learning engine we've developed can be adapted to other application from sleep apnea to epilepsy. And what's really interesting, and I'm going to close with this, is I recently learned that in Chinese medicine, the ear is considered the gateway to our body's well-being. If you think about what we're doing right now, is that we're using this as a way to harness all the recent advances in AI, machine learning, sensors, microchips, as a way to regain our health so that we can deliver better health to everyone. Thank you. Kitos. Fantastic. Thank you. And judges, Luke. Um, I had a few questions just on product specs. So uh, first is battery life. And then uh, number two is just your gross, like the product gross margin, uh, what you plan to sell it for, and then how much it costs you to make today, and then where you think that cost will get you know, in two or three years' time. Absolutely. Thanks for your question. Um, so for battery life, from the beginning, we know that it's going to be used for sleep. So it has to have eight to 10 hours battery life. So that's what, what we have. And then in terms of production, we've been so lucky to be able to partner with an earbud manufacturer. So they already have the full supply chain manufacturing network for us. So we expect that at scale, we have an 80% gross margin. 
and the pricing is that expect 300, 400 plus the subscription for maintenance. Thanks for the, the great pitch. Do, do you yeah. face any kind of regulatory hurdles? Absolutely. Um, so, of course, safety and compliance is top priority for us, right? We're a healthcare product. We want people to have full trust in us. So the device has been designed with all the regulatory requirements in mind. And we are, in our three, four year plan, we are going to submit for medical device certification because that will help with reimbursement and access. However, we are able to launch as a non-invasive -invas wellness device, really tackling sleep improvement, so no specific indication. So that's how we're able to kind of balance the two area. To launch next year, do you still need to do product development or is it just mainly production? What is necessary still to bring it on the market? I would say it's product validation. So of course, launching any product, you're going to get user feedback from the first 10, from the first 100, right? So it's that kind of refinement, but the product itself is built. The sensor has been validated. We recently did a study with a university in the Netherlands showing 99% correlation to the gold standard. So technology is done. It's just a matter of doing the last minute, last minute, last bit of refinement, the last mile thing, yeah. Is this uh, agnostic to the actual earbud, i.e. could you sell this as an OEM to any earbud manufacturer around the world? There is changes in the hardware that we need to make, and that's actually where our patent is, is in the sensing mechanism itself, as well as proprietary algorithm. But in technicality, we are talking to other earbuds manufacturers to implement the sensing mechanism and algorithm onto their earbuds. We've got time for one last question. I think Maxine looks like she has a great question coming. It's not great. Um, I wanted to understand kind of, you said that kind of the teeth clenching and the jaw grinding was correlated or related to sleep disruption, but is it a direct effect of, or like who, what, cause, what is causing what here? And kind of like, how do you, how is that scientifically proven? Yeah, so there's been a lot of studies showing that basically teeth grinding and clenching is our way our body's attempt at stabilizing the sleep. So it's actually an effect of the microarousal, of the sleep disruption. And they've shown this over and over again in many studies. The heart rate goes up first, there's a little bit of arousal, then the teeth grinding and jaw clenching comes. And the reason why our body has that mechanism is that teeth grinding and jaw clenching is actually a helpful physiological response when happening once. You know, it, it lowers your heart rate, it sends, uh, it sends bloodstream to your brain, it actually lubricate your, um, your mouth, and it opens up your airway. When people have apnea, they tend to teeth grind as well because it actually opens up the airway. So it's a helpful response. It's just that when it happens over and over again, it just becomes a habit um, that is not helpful for everyone. But the way to tackle it is to you know, disrupt the habit. That's why the data component of it is also important because if you still have apnea, probably you, know, you can use our earbuds all the time, but you only get 50% reduction because you still have to address your apnea. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Selena. Thank you. Thank you, judges, for the Great questions. App. Thanks. You've now heard the top 20 semi-finalists of Slush 100. One of them is going to win a million euro investment from Axel, General Catalyst, Lightspeed, NEA, and Northzone, who I think are the best investors in the world. Now, what's going to happen next? Our five judges are going to be escorted to a very secret location in the, in the vicinity. Um, and in that room, these five judges are then going to decide who the top three companies are and who's going, to be who's going to be pitching at the finals tomorrow evening. Has this been fun? We'll try that again. Has this been fun? Nice. Fantastic. Um, we're going to head off now, and we'll be back at 3.40 p.m., so 20 to 4 p.m., and we'll be announcing on this stage who the top three are. So be back in about 45 minutes. Thank you from us. In my hands, I have the list of the top three companies in Slush 100. My name is Marco. I'm the head of startups at Slush, and I also run the Slush 100 competition. And I just got back from a very, very gruesome room 
full of five of the investors who were here judging earlier, and they decided who the top three companies are going to be. Before we get into who they are, just a recap of what they're actually competing for. One of these three companies is going to win a 1 million euro equity investment from none other than Axel, General Catalyst, Lightspeed, NEA, and North Zone. Some of the best investors, in my opinion. Are you ready to hear the top three? Let's try that again. Are you ready to hear the top three? That's more like it. Okay, in no particular order, I'm going to share who the top three are leading into tomorrow. When I say a company's name, I ask that you really, really, really erupt properly and excite everybody in the room. Is that okay? We're good? Clear instructions? First company in the top three of Slush 100 in 2023 is... Fercado. Second company in the top three of Slush 100 in 2023 is Congrify. And last, but by no means least, the final company in the top three of Slush 100 in 2023 is Life Year. I also asked the investors to give us a reasoning for why these three were picked. And the reasoning was, the pitches themselves were great, and the use cases for these three products made a lot of sense. In addition to that, the founder background was exceptionally good for these founders as well. There was a founder market fit, I think is a term that they were using there. Thirdly, the market of each of these companies is substantial enough to warrant an actual VC investment. Fourth, this was just one of the companies, Payment infra is apparently a very sexy sector at the moment. I had a hard time believing that, but the VC said it's true. And the final one, which is probably the most critical one that they all spoke about repeatedly, was that each of these top three companies had the right approach to building a scalable company. So let me see the top three companies once again. Fercado from Germany, Congrify from Italy, and Lifeyear from Estonia. Give one massive round of applause for these. How does the competition continue? These three companies are now going to go back to probably their hotel rooms, get those pitches edited, and they're going to get ready to pitch on the final stage tomorrow. Before that, however, they actually also have an investment committee with the five judges tomorrow morning. That's not on show. That's not on a stage. That's happening back doors. But do come back for the founder stage tomorrow evening to see the finals. But please be there for the winner announcement. Trust me, you will not want to miss one of the companies taking home a 1 million euro equity investment. You've been a fantastic crowd. Thank you so much. And I'll give it back to the hosts.